Hey there, Mop Bucket. This is Inuyasha. <laughs> hey, Inuyasha. This is Steven. <laughs> Do you seriously forget what you put in every time? Uh, I remember at this time. I mean, I kind of slipped my mind for a second, but hearing you say it was just really funny. Excellent. Like it's a name. Yeah. I, would you care to explain your name today? Do you do you know what it's from? No. It's from uh, Futurama. There's the one where they switch minds, but like the machine only works like you can't switch right back, so they have to like find you know third person to switch with, etc. Mm -hmm. And Scruffy the janitor's sentient mop bucket switches into Amy's body and mm -hmm. uh, comes in. It's like it's me, mop bucket. I love you. <laughs> and I thought that that came to mind because my new favorite protagonist is Broom. Ooh, excellent. So. Yeah, my favorite protagonist of this story uh, called Project Lawful by Eliezer Yudkowsky and Kelsey Piper. And we discuss it in our podcast called It Makes Sense If You Understand Decision Theory. Yes, it is a great podcast. Um, it makes sense for you guys to donate some money to us <laughs> using the Patreon. If you don't want to, that's fine too. But, you know, we definitely encourage that kind of thing. And we kick back 15% to the original authors of the work. Shall we move into the user listener feedback? Let's move into listener feedback. Okay, the first listener is Inyash. <laughs> uh, I had some feedback. This was something that, like, I don't know. I didn't, when we talked about it, I was like, yeah, I should say something. I don't know, but I don't know exactly what to say. And also, I don't want to spend forever on it. I'm just going to keep going. But then when I was listening to this again while editing, I was like, no, nah, I really, I really did want to bring it up. Um, I was thinking, you seem kind of down on the idea that Ione was offering sex to Keltham as a way to thank him. And I didn't really know what to say because I don't think that's bad, actually. Like, even if they had money or or something else to offer him, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with thanking someone with sex. People who feel warmly towards each other thanks each other in lots of ways, doing favors for them, and maybe sexual favors is part of that, as long as it's a thing you actually want to do rather than something that you're pressured into doing. Yeah, I probably have some knee-jerky reaction against, like, reciprocal sex. I could probably unpack that with a shrink, but I my, my main thing with it is that I think that these girls are being pressured into literally everything they're doing. Then again, I guess in her specific situation, we now have a better idea that she was acting the best that she could given the very, very tight constraints on her freedom. But even then, it still seems kind of coercive, you know? I mean, in, in her situation, yeah, probably. I just, in general, I don't have a problem with someone saying, oh, I really like that. That was great. Um, can I do something nice for you? How about, you know, sex or something? I obviously that might not be her situation if she's being set on fire for not doing what they say, <laughs> but, but in general, I think it's fine. Yeah. I mean, people say that all the time and then people follow them around for years doing them favors and, you know, wait for that payout. Right. So, uh, do they, isn't this a very common thing where there's the common trope of like the, the guy who's into the girl, but the girl isn't into him, but he keeps following around, like doing favors for her. not following her, like stalking, but like the polite leading on thing where it's like, Oh yeah, you know, help me move, help me, you know, do this, do that, and then, you know, five years later, she marries the jock, right? If someone is doing that kind of thing expecting a sex payout, then they're stupid and, I don't know, kind of pathetic? But um, I don't have an issue with people just, like, doing favors for each other. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I guess I was thinking of uh, people leading people on that way, where it's like, you know, expect a sex payout, but it never comes. But also, if this is the kind of thing people are doing all the time, that wouldn't be an unreasonable thing to assume. Yeah. You know? It's fair. I delivered pizzas for like five years and I had mm. one person t try to tip me in pot and that was the only unusual tip that I ever received. Did you take the pot tip? No. Oh. I, I was driving. It was like to hit their bong or something. Oh, uh, it wasn't just like, here's a joint for later. Yeah. Plus I've never, I, I mean, I would probably have found a use for it, but I've never worked my way through a whole joint. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of pot either, but yeah, to, to take a hit when you have to drive, that's, that's just a stupid tip to try to give. Yeah. I was like, no, I'll just leave. Bye. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, no, I, I think you make a good point. Again, everything on Galarian is so fucked up that mm -hmm. I, even taking her money, I'd feel bad about. There's probably some, you know, unfortunate artifact of my prudish uh, culture that would make me feel less bad about her being robbed out of her money than her giving sex away for whatever favors to Keltham or something. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I, I would still feel bad because it's, now that nothing they're doing here is it, discussions of philosoph philosophical free will aside, whatever it is, it's not uh, doing what I say when I have a gun to your head, right? Right. It's like, yeah. well, you could have not done it. It's like, yeah, sure, but then you'd have pulled the trigger. Right. You know? it, whatever yeah. freedom is, it's not that. This Galarian place is looking pretty bad, or at least the Chelyax part of it. It's uh, it's amping up, and Keltham finally mm. seems to be wising up to it. Does he? A little bit. 
Okay, cool. Well, we will get to that soon. Yes. Uh, but first, Old Windways had a comment about when we were talking about uh, the age of having new um, small humans following you around. Uh, he says, if you have a child when you're 22, you will be 40 when they graduate from high school. If you wait until you're 42, they will hit 60 at the same... You will hit 60 at the same milestone, uh, which is a good point. I hadn't really considered that. Uh, the fact that you're going to be... You're going to be kind of running even lower on energy as, uh, as you get older is a thing to consider as well. And then uh, he adds, having younger and more energetic grandparents is more important than having wiser parents. Could I, be. That I might be true. That one. I know a, a family of uh, prolific uh, generations that has their kids in their early 20s. Wow. And so, um, like, this, the, the guy I'm thinking of isn't having kids, but I know that his brother did in his early 20s. And I met his grandparents. And they're like my parents' age. Yeah. And uh, I was I was confused at first because that's you know my parents were low thirties when they had me I think mm -hmm. a couple generations of doing it at nineteen and twenty or whatever and suddenly his grandparents look kind of like my parents plus my parents yeah. both smoked so like they they looked ah, a bit older than faster. they were yeah yep that's a point to consider at the very least like sixty isn't decrepit or anything especially not nowadays but it's uh, it's not nothing yeah you know at forty you can I was gonna say enjoy your life but you're still working until you're in their 60s or whatever usually right so like mm -hmm. the fact that you don't have a kid in the house you know helps a bit maybe mm -hmm. but uh yeah it's it's a huge undertaking either way nice thought though about the grandparents that's a thought provoker yeah i don't have any way to provide input on that since i didn't have grandparents at all so i don't know you know his parents were uh generated in the lab so <laughs> no my grandparents were across the ocean in a different country oh, and i never yeah. yeah yeah oh yeah i knew that but you were explaining for the people that yeah that makes sense yes. um Scharer says that uh since we were talking about sadism a bit sadism isn't taking pleasure in others pain it's taking pleasure from inflicting pain which i think is a good distinction um is that true it's probably true right you're asking the wrong person to be sure but that sounds right um, okay Good, good distinction to keep in mind. There's got to be a term for the people who just like watching people get hurt, though. Uh, yes. Other than monsters. Yeah. Like if it's a whatever, you know, if you're if you're getting off in the in the closet wearing a Superman costume while you're watching an S and M sex session consensually, you're not a monster in that case. But you know, if you're the kind of person who whatever <laughs> watches what? uh, beheading videos on YouTube or something, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Then yeah. Why? Why a Superman costume specifically? I think that was in an episode of Rick and Morty. Oh, like first or second okay. season. Okay, yeah. cool. It, it's just and why why in Rick and Morty? Because it just makes it all the more like funny and weird to explain to your kids yes. or grandkids or whoever it was they're talking to. <laughs> right. All right. One. Uh, well, okay. Another one from the one butcher. Stable society is possible at our average intelligence, which is a thing we said, and we haven't destroyed the world. Our blatant survivorship bias. True. Uh, I think that, yeah. Yeah. Very good point. And he uh, pointed out that uh, while we're at it, the first album is the best one is also survivorship bias plus regression to the mean. And the whole unhappy artists make better art is similar. It's basically a takeoff of that. Um, I guess I've kind of, I've become less enamored of the unhappy artists make better art thing than I used to be. Like I used to be very much into that. And I think that was at least partly a way to, a solid cope for dealing with a lot of depression myself. I do think there's a correlation, but it's probably more things like is still really young and so has lots of time to spend, but also is poor and also only recently escaped from the child prison's uh, torture. So it's more of a correlation than a causation, probably. Yeah. The more I, I really enjoy stand-up comedy and I don't know what art is, but it seems like art. And, you know, mm -hmm. like a lot of like the bleak and misanthropic comedy is really funny, but mm -hmm. it totally doesn't need to be for it to be really good. There, in fact, there's one comedian I can't remember exact context but it was like you know that, how are things going with you guys things are going pretty good for me i know weird right like a comedian like their life's put together you know like <laughs> i just signed for my first house like stuff like that um mm -hmm. and you know it was a funny set so yeah a bunch of people chimed in to say that the most important work is done at the start of the career is actually pretty common in a lot of fields not just the arts i'll take a word for it yeah do you want to grab this last one here yeah um uh, anna on discord said that uh uh i think it was because You'd misscheduled the release, which is totally fine. It was a couple mm -hmm. hours late for people, but uh, 
uh, said that remembering that today is Monday and thus that there's a new episode of our long acronym name episode is literally one of the things that gets me right out of bed with a smile. And that made my day uh, seeing that. Yeah. And I, I replied to that in Discord as well. But thank you. That was very sweet. That was awesome. Doing those kind of things. It's like, feel like you're actually making a difference in the world if people are made a little bit happier. It blows my mind. Almost yeah. literally. Yes. It, it, it does kind of like stagger my imagination, though. Well, let's get on to making people happier. Let's try our best. <laughs> okay. As Modeus is commenting about uh, <laughs> Broom, <laughs> coolest new random character, he's thinking about what his High Priestess did, making him invisible and having a dagger. He's like, okay, that part, that's weird and unpredictable, but Asmodeus doesn't have time to pay much attention to his pet, and his pet squirrel probably knows what it's doing. <laughs> it's not worth an intervention, almost certainly, and never has a more blatant Chekhov's gun been placed on a mantle. <laughs> than saying, it's not worth an intervention. Surely my squirrel knows what she's doing here. Yeah, and it's funny, actually. The squirrel has a thought that's the exact opposite of that. Broom, this random halfling slave, got the uh, the oracle levels from Ot Ottomans. And mm -hmm. when like that exchange initially happened, I think Eliezer cleric him and then, or oracle him or whatever, and mm -hmm. then Kelsey like arrested him, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that that was just going to be the end of it. But the reaction from the Chelish overlords are super consistent with what we'd expect for, like, you know, these actual, like, rational evil people to do, right? Yeah. Just killing the, the, killing the guy wouldn't have, like, that would have been insane, actually. Mm -hmm. It might make sense to kill, or to have killed Ione, because Nethys is the god of basically mischief and madness. Um, right. I know that's not really what his job is, but that seems to be a frequent fallout Attribution? of Attribution? Yes. Yeah. Um, fallout is a good term. But, but the... Uh, but the god of don't destroy the world, you don't just mm. kill somebody if they're cleric by that person, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, what do you feel like doing? We'll enable you however we can. <laughs> uh huh. I'm worried that Ottomans is not quite as. Well, no, Ottom Ottomans has got to be pretty competent, but missing something with the whole being effective in the real world thing. I mean, saying Ottomans is competent might also be survivorship bias. <laughs> I, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> saying that as, as a yeah, but I'm just saying like yeah. you know, the world is on the brink of destruction. Um, yep. Maybe it would have fallen over a hundred times already, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, get good, noob, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see. We do get a little part from Broom right here at the top, uh, which ends with, like so many others in Cheliax, Broom has become not a very distinguishable person from his mask, even to himself. Because he's, you know, not allowing himself to think things, and Jesus, man, this is fucked up when, like, you're so ingrained with the mask you have to project to... Pr prevent yourself from being randomly tortured that it erases basically a large chunk of your brain right just you become a caricature it's horrible i don't think this is this might have been in methodicality but you know you wear a mask for long enough and that just becomes who you are right yeah. and, and it's not like you know your secret you know if he went home and indulged his hobbies every night free of of torture that'd be one thing but he doesn't uh because he can't what you know he, mm -hmm. hobbies aren't safe right because there's something people can take away from you yeah so uh yeah no i mean it's uh it's a drag and his clip art image is or his, his little image is just like clip art of a broom <laughs> yes <laughs> that's cool um oh this is where i was saying that uh aspexia the priestess asmodeus's favoritist pet squirrel um mm. when i said that she because he, he thinks that oh she probably knows what she's doing um but I liked where it says she's, she's going to keep her temper under control uh, when she goes home for the day. If indeed she ever does get home for the day, she's going to order a dozen slaves sent to her, bask in their understandable fears for a while, and then set them all on fire. And, yeah, Jesus. Yeah, she sounds like someone who's got their temper under control, right? I, well, I guess when it matters. <laughs> uh, but then, then she thinks, uh, you know, she wishes that she didn't have to, like, work on this or live here. Wait, but she doesn't have to, live, like, work on this or live here. So everything is fine. Um, <laughs> yeah. the fuck it not my problem attitude and mm -hmm. uh, so then for Asmodeus to think well my squirrel knows what it's doing her idea is like well you know what I gave the guy a, you know a gun and an invisibility cloak I'm getting out of here um, yeah it, which, Asmodeus would have said something if I shouldn't have done that right you know but he wasn't really paying attention he trusted his squirrel so you know that probably probably was the smart move but no. you know her move her move isn't to, like hang out and make things go okay it's just like Okay, look, I'm going to just prep this best I can and get the hell out of here and go torture some people. You know, good old-fashioned Friday afternoon fun. Yeah. Um, mm. 
Uh, Asmodeus' favorite pet squirrel in all of Galarian has been spooked by Ottomans hanging around. To be fair to his pet squirrel, this is literally among the most reasonable possible reasons for a pet squirrel to become spooked. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> I, I just, I, I don't think I'll ever get tired of them having chosen squirrels to call, pe- mm. like, for a substitute for people. I think that's always going to be funny for me. Mm, cool. And and it's proof that she's doing Asmodeusism, Asmodeusism right. Why is that? Because uh, is she's his favorite is pet squirrel. Oh yeah, that's true. I mean, maybe he. It might be he. You know, he likes her for other reasons or something. You know, she's funny or whatever. But no, I think that she's doing it correctly. Yeah. And so when she's frustrated that everyone else is trying to be, you know, over interpretive or whatever, he's mm-hmm. just like, nope, you do what you told. I love you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're gonna make you my high priestess because you know exactly what I want. Oh yeah, she's probably been also involved in like a direct revelation. I, I'm not sure how you become a high priestess, but that sounds like you know one of the ways. I would imagine there had to be something at some point. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I, I assumed like might, maybe it was um, whatever you know. Like I don't know if you become queen by being a good Asmodee or whatever through God edict. Maybe I thought it might have just been nepotism or politics or whatever. But you're right. Uh, he 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 probably waited. And it's like I like this one, uh, right? Yeah. In, so, in yeah. some some method of communication. Mm-hmm. Speaking of methods of communication between gods, uh, I notice that Yone Sala does not have a face cast, and that kind of worries me. Does does this mean she's not going to be around for a long time if they didn't take the effort to find a face cast for her? That's a valid concern, and I... Well, I mean, they found a picture even... for Broom. <laughs> yes, they did. Even Broom has clip art. So, like... You know, finding a picture isn't that hard. Maybe, like, other than drawings or whatever, um, uh, Keltham and Chris are the only people we have with face casts. Yeah. So maybe it's just, like, we don't want to find a new actress and go snag, you know, 60 pictures off of, you know, random movies or whatever, right? That's true. It would be worth it for another major character, probably. I mean, major and main, you know, it's, it's hard to say. Um, yeah. but you know, I don't know what the dimensions here are, are here either. So, um, yeah, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll have to see. Okay. Well, Keltham is thinking about how he, his, his various harem mates are getting superpowers. And he says, this is so reminiscent of an arrow LARP where the potential romantic interests all have special powers. And Keltham accidentally hit on this girl's unlock condition unreasonably early. And now she's going along with the script and revealing some of her hidden story and offering him the scripted level of in-game abilities and sexual access. Uh, first of all, I, I kind of always enjoy when people think in game terms and apply it to the real world. And you're like, man, this is so weird. This is just like that video game because I to my chagrin, have done that a lot in my real life, too. Where I'm like, yeah, this real life thing is like a video game where it's always supposed to be the other way around. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> also... Life imitates uh, art, art, art imitates life, you know. Yeah, yeah. But also, this is a fucking awesome idea, and I'm kind of sad that the laws in this world will not will not let that happen. But, like, holy crap, that would be fun. Hasn't, isn't it actually number- kind of happened, though? Has it? yeah. His Haramites keep... What he's, what he's saying here is true. No, I mean, in planet Earth. Oh. I mean, yeah, that, that like, sometimes I, happens. I know, I know... You know, like, if you're two years old and your life? your rich uncle dies and leaves you $10 million... That you you still can't go around hiring people to put on an arrow LARP that has sexual unlocks. Oh, I thought you were saying life doesn't have, uh, like, unlocked perks like that. No, no. I meant, like... I, I know some LARPers and some who like get really into it and travel to foreign countries and put on costumes and like play in character for 10 days. And it's, it's really cool shit. Like the people who really get into this and I could see like people who are into sex and wanting to play this sort of thing, being down for it. But I don't think that would be legal. As, I mean, I guess if everyone was just doing it as a volunteer basis, but to have a professional LARP where you could pay to, to do this kind of thing, we couldn't do that. Now that that's, that's kind of sad. We're getting there. Give it a couple more years of VR tech. I think we'll be getting... I, I imagine something like this will be here before... What year is it? 2023? Summer of 23? I, I bet by summer of 25, we'll have some version of getting blown online with uh, VR tech. Mm, and frankly, that's a, that's, a, that's a fairly pessimistic uh, estimate. I, I, I don't know. That's, that, that, is, that is not what I am... I, I still think prostitution would be illegal in the US in 2025, is what I'm saying. Oh, sure. Illegal, but... People will do it. It's true. Yeah, we'll see. All right. Well, all we need is our own offshore island somewhere, huh? Well, I mean, like, 
it's like selling sex is illegal, but giving it away for free isn't. Right. And so people, like the government can't stop people from having sex. Yeah. And so unless they're going to monitor every sexual interaction, people are going to occasionally pay for it. Yes. So like this is just a... You're right. This could happen. You just couldn't market it. Right. It, it'll be like a thing everyone knows happens, but you, you're not allowed to like explicitly sell. All right. Fair enough. Yeah. That, that's, that's, that's a better way to do it anyway. That's my guess. Yeah. Keep, yeah. keep the taxes out of it. Well, I mean, well, not only that, that way you also know everybody involved so you can vet the people and know that one, they're cool with it and two, they're not going to fuck things up. I don't think that's how it even works now, actually. Mm. I'm not an expert, but I did just watch a really funny movie that came out like 10 years ago uh, called Where the Millers, yeah. starring Jason Sudeikis and um, uh, Jennifer Aniston. Mm. And uh, Jennifer Aniston is a stripper. And like at the when she's leaving that job, it's because the boss walks in and says, like, hey, we're going to do this new th this new uh, company policy thing now. You're going to start having you're going to start having sex with the customers for money. Uh, and then she, oh. she quits. Uh, I, I think that some places do do that. And it's it's not like, oh, you know, everybody and everything's copacetic and awesome. It's like, well, I need to do this because it's my job. And I don't want I mean, to, but, you know. Of the couple strippers I've known, the policy was actually, if we catch you having sex with anybody, you are immediately fired. Because totally. Because then they, the place loses its license. Re reputable places, I think, don't do that. Disreputable, okay. disreputable places exist, though. All right, fair enough. But I say this like I know what I'm talking about. I've never, you know... <laughs> paid for sex at a strip club so yeah uh, i i like the at a strip club <laughs> yeah i mean you know <laughs> I, I don't, don't, don't want to you know make a blanket yeah, statement yeah. sure right yes <laughs> of course um wh where was this oh okay yeah ione gets a so uh Keltham goes back to the library. Uh, Ione gets the book borrowing class power and tells Keltham about it and gets a book for him. And as Modia tries to read her mind and Iona makes a save to resist it, which I thought was pretty cool. And then they, you know, they have not a friendly rivalry after that. They, they kind of actually really dislike each other after this. That actually brought a question up for me because she, like, she notices the mind read attempt and makes a will save and succeeds. Mm-hmm. But Keltham's been having his mind read, well, he did up until the first night, uh, mm -hmm. nonstop. And he wasn't, as far as we know, making will saves and losing. So how did she know? Like, Possibly you think there's like a level of she... like aptitude and then suddenly you you can detect it and defend against it? That would be my guess, that it's kind of instinctual before then. And when you're a wizard, you can feel it. Maybe that's why they're not trying, though, that he's a level four cleric. Yeah, well, yeah. And also, isn't he protected by his god? I don't think... Or maybe... I think it's implied. Or they don't know, right? Right. It, it could be, like you said, they just know that he'd be able to tell they're doing it now, and they don't want him to know that. Yeah, certainly that's not the kind of thing you do to somebody without asking first if they're going to find out about it, right? Or if you think that it doesn't matter and you can just impose your will on them. Oh, yeah, but he would probably cease cooperating pretty quickly. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, Ione gets that book teleporting ability, which is kind of cool. It's like Harry's magical trunk, except more magical. Any any library that she's been to, she can just pull a book out of it. Yes. And she thinks it's the best curse ever, and I kind of agree. As far as curses it's, go, it's 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 up there. It's a pretty good curse. I could think of more creative curses that I would rather have, but as long right. as I had to have this one. It's an, it's an ice perk. She wants to read anyway, right? That the curse has positives, it makes it feel like less of a curse. I'd almost feel like they should be broken into two different things. The curse of being stuck in this library, plus the special power of getting to get books any with time. But, yeah, you know, you can call it just one single thing, I guess. I think, like, the, the thing that ties them together is that she's always in a library. And, like, a platonic library, not, like, this one in the building. I think, likewise, it's like, all right, well, then wherever else you are also counts as, as a, what's a library? They're all the same. You know, if you want to reach into this one and grab a book, that's fine. I can kind of see... Uh, that being the Nethesy way of just describing the same kind of phenomena, right? Yeah. But it, it, at least it has its perks. But you're right. they do. It is definitely like enough of an up that it seems like weird to call it a curse. Yeah. Because it's definitely just a perk. It's like, oh man, I'm cursed with these good looks and all this <laughs> intelligence. Shit. <laughs> Sing it to the choir, man. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so she writes a note to Keltham outlining her ability with a couple of false caveats. And... Uh, then I liked the line that said, security is not stopping her, though if a halfling were to stab her, they would not be sorry, just saying. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to, I, I should find out who said that, because it, it's kind of like inviting the person writing this to let that happen. I 
I think it was Kelsey that was, yeah. that was writing that. At the so time. Okay. it seems like Eliezer is the one who's been interested in Ione. And uh, Kelsey is like, hey, you know, if you want to kill her, you know, just saying, you know, green light <laughs> for me. Um, again, the, the collaborative authorship is fun. Yeah. Um, so he, this happens shortly after uh, the Owl's Wisdom thing. He's asking, all right, should I do Owl's Wisdom or Eagle's Splendor? Um, mm -hmm. And the harem says Owl's Wisdom is up to two minutes per caster circle. Uh, and haste is up to two rounds per caster circle. And he's like, yeah. okay, so Owl's Wisdom first, and then someone can do haste, and you know, like he just runs past what is around. Yeah, and that that kind of bummed me out. I wish, I mean, I assume somewhere earlier off screen he was told what a round is, like that it's however many seconds. I do wish that we had seen what that when that was, or if like the translation spell just translates it into. 30 seconds, you know, in his mind. That could be. I feel like we're getting things translated as he's hearing them. Um, I get that feeling too. But, it, it, you know, if it happened off screen, like, he could say, okay, well, why do you guys call them rounds? The thing is, this is a game mechanic. Yeah. And I don't know. Maybe maybe Dothalan runs on the same shit. And, like, this is normal to him. Because he says, like, shortly after, he says, I don't know if I'll ever request a spell from my god again. Uh, and as foolish as I am, I think I forgot... Uh, to think of this contingency earlier, but does anyone have a simple exercise for me to perform in the realm of acting and emoting? I'd gain skills and experience, if I could, before this spell fades. Um, oh, I did not take that as a game reference. See, I did it first, and then when I was putting it in the show notes, I was like, okay, maybe he's just using skills and experience the way we use it, without yeah. realizing that those are capital letter words on Galarian. Yeah, yeah. Um, so oh. I, I thought that he'd just been fully bought into the game mechanics stuff and didn't and we don't need a debriefing and i'd put a little table flipping emoji um, <laughs> that is a very interesting um translation error there or not error but translation artifact that he used that word and they also have that word but they mean slightly different things to the two of them and neither of them know that it's being interpreted the other way i mean so like you know here on earth you and i gain skills and experience when we do stuff right yep but yeah, we yeah. don't hit level 15 and get a perk after that, right? We usually do not. So it, there, it's they almost shouldn't be called the same thing, even though they reflect a very similar mechanic of life, right? Um, I mean, if there was a type of skill we had that worked like we know it and a type of skill that works like a game, then we should definitely have two different things. But the reason the game mechanic is named skills is because it's supposed to approximate how a skill would work in a game setting, right? Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. And, and on... On Earth, it makes sense. I guess I'm just thinking like uh, they're going to have this at some point. I'm hoping. It, I'm hoping it, like I didn't read this or that I read this correctly the second time, and then he's just using skills and experience the way we use it. But at some point, they're going to be using that. And they're going to be talking past each other because they probably definitely assume he works the same way. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's going to be cool when it happens. He's going to be like, "Wait, I, I was talking just about getting better at stuff." It's like, "Yeah, me too." They're like, "What? Do you, what's the difference?" <laughs> they're going to have like this kind of you know who's on first kind of moment, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that should you be know, fun. As, as you progress one level on the hundred levels of skills that you can have. <laughs> okay, pause. The fuck are... <laughs> what in the ass are you talking about? <laughs> I now have additional questions. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That round catch, I hadn't thought that at the time, but now that you mention it, maybe they explained at some previous time that, like, for some unknown reason, the way magic works is that it often breaks things down into unique... into chunks of time that... It, approximate about eight seconds each or whatever it is you know and since this happens so frequently this multiple of this time span in all sorts of spells it must be some kind of natural law that we don't quite understand and we just call them rounds to have a word for that that part's all fine and dandy to me actually it's the so in a, in a round in D, D, isn't it like it's our turn this round or whatever like all right you, you've got your six seconds go ahead and act like no one can interrupt your round without like a special magic or something Yes, but in theory, they're all supposed to take place kind of at the same time. And just some people have higher initiative, so they are faster than other people. And, and they move first. And you're, uh, like, you could basically one action per round. Yeah. And so it, if this works as, like, the alignment system seems pretty literal, right? Mm -hmm. So this works as literally as it does in Pathfinder slash D&D. The first time he sees combat, it's going to be people standing there. You know, not standing there. They're going to be using the time, right? But it's it's going to be mm -hmm. awfully odd watching them kind of take turns. I I'm curious how this is going to shake out. So I guess what I'm saying is I'm still dying to get this closure slash moment, and I'm I'm uh, still being dragged along. It's interesting. Older versions of D and D were far less concrete. They like some of them had um, 
explanations that a round is just a period of time when some things happen and it could be like one minute it could be up to 10 minutes and during that time period when you make one attack roll that's not like one time you're trying to swing your sword it's a number of back and forths and parries and stabs and you know do you manage to get some sort of damage across in that time period and then the concept of armor class and preventing damage was not are you cut and how much blood do you lose but literally does damage get through somehow it also represents fatigue and luck and things like that so much more abstract back then he might not see you know discrete eight second chunks where people can only swing once in that time period and have to wait on, on other actions. That's a good point. All right. Well, we'll, we'll see how it shakes out. I'm, yeah. I'm really excited to, you know, to see how this, how this rolls. Yes. Uh, he casts Eagle Splendor first. Uh, he cast it on accident because he thought he was casting um, all his wisdom and turned out to be Eagle Splendor, right? Yep. I mean, they're both birds. I'm sure, oh, no. I'm sure they're very similar looking spells. Or maybe that was when he was trying to cast it. The other one. No, right, he, the point he, is, he definitely cast Eagle Splendor on, on first on accident. Okay. Yeah. And um, then he knows uh, once he has Eagle Splendor and he has all this extra social ability, he says he knows what he could say to express those thoughts. Uh, was, Any words he said would be something like a lie. Keltham does not know under this spell how to do anything that is real. I just, I don't know. I felt sometimes I get that feeling too where I'm not sure how to. It feels like anything I would say is so calculated based on everything around me that I, I wouldn't know how to concretely actually express myself in the situation, you know? And that sucks. I feel like that's probably human universal, which is why Kulth was able to say this and, like, we can resonate with it. Um, yeah. Like, you know, somebody tells you some bad news or whatever, and you're like, oh, that sucks, right? Because it does. Yeah. But, like, yeah. you don't know. There's, there's nothing to say because it's all just terrible, you know? Yeah. Uh, so it there uh, there's all kinds of moments where things are awkward or whatever, right? Um, yeah. But you just got to kind of like some sometimes it's real, sometimes it's not. And when it's I not, you do your best to get as close to real as you can, I guess. The just doing a lot of processing before you react tends to make it feel distant, like it's been put through a layer of filters. And I think that's what Kelton is feeling right now. I have this other unfortunate ingredient to that too where like i seem to be aware of my facial expression all the time oh interesting and so like if i'm if i'm showing a reaction it's on purpose yeah and then it feels like oh, well if it's man. on purpose then it's then it's fake and it's like it's not yeah. it's genuine but the fact oh. that I'm, I'm choosing to express it makes it feel fake uh right it's i don't know weird mm. but i i did not know that about you that you always know what your facial expression is at least mostly always more often than not yeah. yeah 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 that's that's really interesting i'm i'm sorry that's yeah that's got to be it's got to be rough yeah i mean it, it probably has its perks you know I, i'm not sitting there scowling if i'm in a bad mood or something unless i want to you know like, right and you've gotten used to it so yeah I, th I think it's it might just be might be part of what comes with the mindfulness thing um mm. but if that sounds like a, a huge um malediction i don't want to you know undersell the benefits of you know, I don't want to. I don't want to attribute it to mindfulness necessarily, unless you know other people can corroborate. So, I never, right. I've never yeah. done any sort of meditative stuff in a collaborative setting. So, huh. any you know, some of the stuff that I attribute to it, or or you know, might miss that I, you know, actually got from from doing this. Uh, maybe I'm, you know, I I might oh, be miscategorizing so some stuff. By collaboration, I do you mean like somebody guides you in a guided meditation thing? I've never been with a real person. Well, once I did it with a real person who was doing it. Um, and I guess that was also like in a class. But yeah, for the okay. most part, it's just uh, tapes of guided meditations or just solo. Um, okay. I wasn't sure how you would do a collaborative meditation, but then yeah, a guiding, it would make sense. Yeah, like a retreat or even just like under, you know, any sort of, of guidance with, uh, you know, uh, an instructor. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Okay. Yeah, so he gets Eagle Splendor, and they start doing some role play to practice his um, acting abilities. It was great. And he's like, might as well go it, all in while it lasts. And I like that, because yep. he's like, oh, whoops. Well, fuck it. Let's make the best of it. And we get to have like a really fun back and forth for a while. Yeah, he sounds... I thought he sounded a lot like Lucius Malfoy when he was doing the Duke. Did you think that? The Duke was, oh, talking to his son about rhinoceros racing? And and yes, yeah. Well, in general, he he kind of sounded like that as like when he was trying to do his charming gentleman thing, but especially with the son being the rhino, yeah. That struck so, me as Lucius. the The rat, uh, the rat exterminator, struck me as Harry. 
<laughs> yes, that's great too. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've I've taken care of five thousand such cases in the last week, and when yeah. I was reading that, I was like, oh, see, this is like the natural end point of like a one-upsmanship contest, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then sub- shortly after, someone says, "I've done a million in the last week or in the last ten days." It's like, oh, okay, that's the actual end point of a one-upsmanship contest. <laughs> <laughs> My competitors talk a good game, but have you considered that they might actually be rats wearing clever disguises? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> It was awesome. Uh, yeah, this is just full of hilarity. He, uh, as Modia and Yone are still beefing, so she calls her a... She's like, can I interest you in a slightly used mud golem? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of drive-by uh, disses in this story, whether it's drive-by diss at Earth or the characters at each other. Um, yeah. But yeah, the, the, like, the little flame war they have was great. I <laughs> like a the- lightly used mud golem. <laughs> and I, you know, I'm sure mud golems are a thing and that, you know, they have their uses or whatever. But mm. it's definitely not a compliment, no matter how cool mud golems are. <laughs> right. And so it you know, could have been selling anything. A slightly used one is even better. <laughs> You're not even getting a fresh from the flat factory floor mud golem. <laughs> oh. I, uh, it, it was interesting. They're trying to root out if he's like a thief casing the joint or not. And this was really cool. He gets a charisma bump from the spell, and then he actually gets better at flirting. He he says, we've hardly even met, and here you're asking me about my previous golem history? And he inches forward and leans slightly and smiles flirtatiously, and I was like, oh my god, the spell's actually working. This is so much better than what he was trying to do earlier. I think that he, like, knew how to do all that stuff, right? It's just that mm-hmm. now he's he's able to think of something funnier to say on the, you know, the exact moment. And, like, this is all stuff that, you know, looking back at the end of the day, if he'd done this without Eagle's Splendor, he's like, oh, I could have said this and done that. It's just like, it right, gives him... A little bit of edge to do it in yeah. the moment. That, that that is what the charisma is, right? Yeah, yeah. No, it's just um, like I feel like with Owl's wisdom, it it actually gives him. Well, you know, he could have had this perspective without the wisdom bump um, when when we get there. But I wonder if it's as uh, profound. I don't know if yeah. I'm. I can't think of the specific example, but uh, or the specific language in the text. But uh, yeah, the the owl the owl's wisdom seems to be like more of him in a, in a totally different state. Maybe I, maybe uh, Eagle Splinter only adds two levels of charisma or something, and Owl's Wisdom adds three levels of wisdom or something. I'm pretty sure I it's not know. that, because I think they said two already, actually, for... Uh, oh, it's two minutes per caster circle. But it doesn't say how high it goes. But in any case, I figured, like, it just seemed like a, a more dramatic turn. I, I mean, considering how badly I thought he did in his previous flirting, and where this one actually felt like, oh, that was smooth, I, I would have feel happy to uh pull off something like that i think it's significantly better yeah yeah no it is i just like i said uh i i'm probably beating this too hard but i it seemed like this is something that he could have done under his natural ability or at least look back on at the end of the day and be like oh i wish i'd done that Uh, right based of what we've seen on him i do not think he could have done this under his natural ability maybe he could have thought of it afterwards but like you know, at that point, you've already lost. Right, that's what I mean, is that he could have done it afterwards, but I don't think that he would have had the same insights that he had on Owl's Wisdom without it. Mm, in that case, I take back my thought that he could have thought of this afterwards. <laughs> if it's as as big of a difference. No, you're right. I, I think, I'll, I'll concede, I think you're probably right, that this is, this level, I think what it is, is that I understand Wisdom better than I understand Charisma. Ah, okay. And so... Like, I know what Grisma is, and I liked what he talked about when he first started describing it. He's like, I became aware of things that I was already kind of aware of, but like I knew I was really aware of, like posture. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I get what he's talking about. And I did a good job of, of showing what a level up in Charisma looks like. You know, the closest I have to that remembering from uh, Worth a Candle is June trying to get uh, level up his intimidation, uh, or no, his seduction or whatever on Amaryllis. <laughs> right, yeah, that was great. Yeah, and he rolls a nat zero, and he, you know, <laughs> or a nat one, and like... Just he's like, oh, I critically failed. She's like, yeah, I saw. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was fantastic. Oh god, if you guys haven't read Worth the Candle, read Worth the Candle. Good, yeah, it's great. Good stuff too. Yeah, um, yeah. So Keltham, he is fucking around, playing with his new charisma. He says that he knows that learning a new art often feels like screwing up or even meta screwing up the process of learning. It doesn't occur to him to be embarrassed about that happening in public, which made me very happy. This is one of the great things about Dathalon. The the first step at getting good at something is kind of sucking at something. And nobody shames you for that because everybody knows that's the first step. That is how it should be. Yeah, they get a lot of stuff right that, like on reflection, is super obvious and we should be doing better. 
I can understand why the reason that we don't do it better. Kids suck and they're mean to each other because it's like just basic monkey dominance, right? And if you see, if you see somebody trying and failing to do something, you get to be a step above them on the hierarchy by saying, look at how much they suck. I never understood doing that unless like you're already enemies with someone and you're trying to tear them down. But I, I don't think that's like what's going on in their minds exactly. I just I, that, I think that explains the behavior. For an instinctive behavior, though, that they aren't aware what they're doing, it's just so shitty. Yeah. I don't know. So, so there's a lot of other instinctive behaviors. We'll get better. Yeah. We're working on it. Yeah. All right. That's true. This was a really interesting thing. He asked for input from everybody as to what do you think I should do next and how strongly do you think it by, you know, raising your hand up or down. They kind of like look at each other and nervously settle on the same answer by looking back and forth, which, first of all, as he points out, should not have happened. He had a lot of cool uh, commentary about that. But the more interesting part is that they all had their hands open and lifted height, you know, kind of up a, a bit and outward. And yeah, surprise, he just made them all Heil Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> Great trolling, Keltham. I hope, I don't think Dothalon had a Hitler. Or if they did, he was much scarier and probably didn't have as many cartoonish little bits like, you know, the Heil thing, right? But You think the Heil thing was cartoonish? Well, not necessarily. I guess it's just, it's the kind of thing they eat. Like, it's just, it's a salute, right? Yeah, it makes sense as, like, a, a thing that you would do here on Earth if you're basically a monkey. And it's like, you know, yes, tribe loyalty, gesture, you know? It's like clapping, yeah. you know? But I don't know if Dothalon, they would, you know, clap their hands red just because, you know, the Fuhrer walks into the room, right? Oh, right, yeah. Because they're they're too reasonable to, you know, every, and the thing is, they all know they're all too reasonable for that. So they would just, like, yeah, we're all going to just be serious about this. Ah, so he can't even laugh that he just made them Heil Hitler. I mean, I just hope they didn't have one, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah probably was screened off oh yeah could be all right all right let's go on i i liked uh carissa points out that they're also hell-bent on killing as many rats as possible that, that they might be releasing them with the opportunity mm. and kelvin says good comprehension of perverse incentives carissa or he's thinking this kelvin wasn't quite sure how much of that kind of knowledge would exist in a place like chelyax which is just kind of an adorable thought because mm. like i'm sure chelyax has brought perverse incentives to a whole new level and they think the dothalon's version is cute oh yeah good point I mean, yeah, this is probably a thing they're intimately familiar with. Yeah, I mean, we they, this is their entire life, right? Like, yeah. they're, they're they're waiting for the, the delightful opportunity to be tortured and molded into a new person. Every everything is with that already super perverse incentive. I mean, in Chelyax, there's probably a kidnapping ring that goes around finding kids and throwing them into ponds so that they can extort money from people saving them. Well, they would if anyone cared to save them. <laughs> That's a good point. I, this was something that comes up later, but uh, when I forget the guy's name, the whatever security wizard that we kind of like, but he's an asshole. Um, Elias? Elias. El Elias, that's right. Elias, uh, yeah. He was like, yeah, I went around looking for people that you liked to, you know, torture or, you know, hurt as blackmail, but I couldn't find any. Um, mm -hmm. So you're even perversely incentivized to not make friends. Like we've had, I don't know, two or three people come by our place in the last six months trying to sell us on exterminator services. Mm -hmm. And I liked to joke, especially like when those moths showed up, that like the guy just has like a you know a bunch of them in his backpack and just like grabs a fistful and threw them into the house, like into the garage when we walked past it, because we mm -hmm. didn't pay for his services, right? Ah, uh, and like th that's that's the kind of level that Keltham's thinking at, you know, yes. with a, with a bit more reason behind it. But uh, he's not thinking, well, I'll just find your your favorite childhood puppy and set it on fire in front of you over and over until you cooperate, like, you know. Right. Well, that's that's not a perverse incentive though. That's just straight out violence right but the, but it incentivizes you to not make friends and to be an evil person because because any sign of goodness is used as as an as a as a method of torture to stamp out of you you're yes. right it's not it's not an economic per perverse incentive but I, I feel like it's a similar kind of behavior i see what you're saying now and i agree with it all right it just took me a second to get to your level probably because i'm not using the word right but what can i do we'll change the word to suit our needs that's right take that language yeah all right, so then he gets the Owl's Wisdom cast on him, which is, like, a real big part here. Uh, it is a huge change for him, and it starts out uh, with Keltham letting us know that there are known drugs that seem to have the effect of permanently relaxing your priors about whatever somebody says to you while you're on drugs, which in Dothalani terms is something like a date rape of the soul. Uh, he's obviously talking about LSD here, and I think he even calls out LSD by name later on in the episode. Like, I... I don't know. I've heard people have had this kind of thing, but I have not had this experience with LSD, despite the fact that, like, on LSD, I once touched God, and at another time, like, I dissolved bodily, and I don't understand why some people lose so much of themselves on LSD. Like, you just remember that this is a drug doing this to you. It's not reality. I 
I haven't had the experience of having like my reality, you know, or my whatever, my post drug trip version of myself altered too much by what, what I thought and experienced while on drugs. That's said, I've never, yeah. I've never touched God or dissolved bodily, but what I have is, okay, you know, and they're hard to remember because de- I was going to say by definition, which is funny because we're talking about that in patient conspiracy, but um, like where I, I realize, you know, during, while it's still going on and that, well, whatever, while I'm still on the trip, I realized like, oh, for the last increment of time, I have no idea. I don't remember. Like, I remember realizing just now that I'm Steven and I took a drug. Oh, but, neat. but for like the last while, I didn't know that. I was just having experiences. There was no Steven in the middle of it. Hmm. Uh, I think that, so I've experienced, I think, what people call ego death, um, but never bodily dis- dissolving or uh, God touching. So that sounds fun. Uh, maybe I haven't taken enough drugs if I haven't got complete ego death where there was no Eniosh. I, you know, it, it's the kind of thing that I think when it happens might be subtle. At least it, it can be subtle sometimes when it happens to me. You know, it happens during the day too, like when you're in a flow state, right? Oh, you're, you're, yeah, that's true. So, I mean, it's it's just, I think when it's on, like if someone asked me if I was, you know, tripping and I was able to re- respond to them, if they're like, hey, are you, you know, experiencing ego death? The answer I think would always be no, yeah. right? Because just in, in the experience of, of processing the question, I have to remember what that means. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm a person. And I took a drug right. at 9 a.m. this morning. Um, so, uh, anyway, I, first of all, that sounds awesome. Uh, the, the God touching and the body dissolving, uh, that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And you did say your, your next note here, uh, your vision was mildly fucked for a few weeks. Yeah. Uh, one time I was, I don't know. I was looking out the window and the, the lines, the power lines outside were jumping and I was like, oh, that's neat. I bet that's the saccades happening and my, my brain not being able to integrate them as as it normally does, right? Cutting out all the jiggling and just stitching together a coherent picture. It actually saw the jiggling as my eyes are moving back and forth quickly. Uh, but then uh, for a couple of weeks afterwards, whenever I were, looked at power lines, particularly like if there was something intersecting them, like a window frame or or something in the foreground that like, you know, blocked my view of them in a straight line. Uh, I would see jumping at the at the edge there, and that was that was kind of annoying. I was like, I wonder if this is gonna be for the rest of my life, but it was not. My brain eventually got back to stitching pictures together fine. A few weeks is the longest side effect I've ever heard. Uh, uh, that's yeah, that's not, wild. I mean, not super long, less than a month. Still though, I mean, you know, because what you're describing sounds like seeing power lines outside outside of your windshield, you know, while driving. Uh, it, it, what do you mean? Like y- y- the conditions that you said needed to happen for this this phenomena to? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was super common. Yeah, I'm just saying that sounds distracting as all hell. And ah, you're lucky right. it was just power lines, and it wasn't like all parallel lines. That's a good point. Yeah. I mean, th- then you'd be like, well, I can't drive for a couple, you know, a couple weeks. Uh, someone needs to bring me groceries. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, hmm. No, that that's that's crazy. Uh, I, I he goes on to continue to bash uh whatever mind altering drugs oh, that, yeah. that said says- i will say that i i liked the um uh uh the analogy to date rape of the soul um yes because you know the effect of permanently relaxing your priors about whatever somebody says to you while you're on drugs um i haven't taken those drugs the closest i could think of might be something like mdma uh mm-hmm. but even then like <laughs> maybe this is maybe this is the drugs talking but i feel like when people <laughs> talk to you while they're on all they're also on mdma i guess that's one of the things I'm, i've maybe one time taken it with somebody who wasn't on it um mm-hmm. but when they're on it they're they're actually saying genuine stuff and so I, you can relax your priors because they're uh um they've relaxed their propensity to whatever shade things um, yeah well it's it's not like every time you have sex with someone else you're getting date raped but there's the possibility for it i I think that's what he's saying like sure you could just be on drugs and someone that you love is on not on drugs and you guys are talking and that's fine but they could take the opportunity to fuck you up uh yeah i guess i'm just thinking like if someone were to say something totally incongruent to me even while on the druggiest drugs i've ever drugged i would i would be able to flag it um okay but maybe i just haven't drugged hard enough which in that case i'm fine with i've never done drugs around people that i don't trust um same so yeah yeah so i don't know that maybe that could be bad times don't do drugs with your cults people i guess yeah (laughs) set and setting yeah if you're gonna do them at all and you know go in carefully Uh, this is a good time just to mention that i'm pretty sure uh at least last i checked i know that 
as of some years ago, Yudkowsky had never taken a psychedelic. Okay. Uh, so if he's if he's railing on him, it's because uh, you know his his mental model of them is just from what you hear on you know uh, forums or TV or whatever. In which I mean, case, it's it's totally legit to say you know it, it's all weird shit and there's no use for them. I think that uh, um, yeah, like, that was that that was one weird thing when he said they don't do anything useful that can't be done by a high ranking keeper just talking to you. Like I. I think that's just not true. I mean, I guess it's true in the same way that there's nothing useful you can learn about a place by visiting it that you couldn't learn by reading about it. But <laughs> there is a substantial difference between the two. I like that analogy really. Uh, I, I think that hits it really well. Um, yeah. You know, it. I think my primary assumption here is that this this might not even be something Eliezer believes. I think this could just be a noble lie that they tell on Dothalan to prevent people from possibly fucking themselves up. Yeah, it, it's it's a noble lie that isn't like that noble or even that necessary. I think it, it but that that's distinctly plausible. Uh, yeah. You know, because maybe it it does turn you know some non negligible percentage of the population you know nuts. Um, yeah, yeah, and so they're like, okay, well, we can't have everyone trying this, so we're going to just say it's bad for you, uh, and right. that you know, really, you can just talk to smart people long enough, you'll get the same sort of stuff. But like, if you want to just have a weird day you know, where shit's moving around and the floor is melting, but it's not scary. Like that's not going to happen by a keeper just talking at you unless your keepers are magic. So, right. yeah. um, you know, it, the insights that you might have again, I, that's, that's where I like your analogy a lot. It, this is one of the frustrating thing, frustrating things of trying to explain an insight to somebody. Right. It's like, I can just keep telling you the words, but I can even think of all the other ways of putting it that I can, but it doesn't click until it act, until you actually have it click for you. You know? Yeah. I can't, I can't click it for you. Right. And also, I don't don't necessarily want anyone to take this like as an endorsement of using drugs, because they really are powerful things that can actually fuck you up. So yeah, do, eh, do your research and be safe. Yes. And maybe just consider not doing it unless you're willing to take a risk. That sounds reasonable. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's always gonna be a risk, even if you've had, you know, 10 good times in a row. Yep. Um, so yeah, you know, play it safe. Yeah, or, or not, but don't well, think that you're not don't think that you are playing it safe. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So he lists a number of revelations that he had while he is on the uh, Owl's Wisdom. He runs off to and... go think after he like demonstrates in front of the group that he's wiser or something. Yeah. I forget what he even says in front of the group. He's just like, well, now I got to go. Um, yep. And use this time well. So bye. I have to freak the fuck out in the closet because, oh my God. So he writes in code to himself and most of the codes, well, all of them except one, I believe I understood. The first code that he writes down is blue and orange. And Broncos, it means... baby. <laughs> There's no way it's that. No. Uh, he says shit basically boils down to shit may be fucked up here. There's something bad going down, and I don't know what it is. What What is blue and orange a reference to? I don't know. Damn it. I was hoping you would know. Maybe someone else will know. Nope. Because it's... Or, I mean, they uh, might, but it, yeah, I don't know. It's some sort of cultural reference from Dothalon, which, you know, is similar to Earth, that they wouldn't get on Galarian, and I want to know what it was. I really liked the subverted Truman show. Yeah, which is basically everyone is fake all the time here, and what the fuck is up with that? And subverted in the fact that he's realized this. Uh, yeah. Because right? he, yeah. he's seen through it now, and he's like, okay, well, they're always all smiling, they're always all acting the same, and, mm -hmm. you know, I can chalk some of it up to just cultural stuff, but some of it just seems way too staged. Yeah. And I think subverted also in the fact that he thinks everybody knows they're doing the Truman Show thingy, but doing it anyway. Yeah. I, at least I got the impression that that was his thinking. I mean, on the non-subverted Truman Show, every, everyone except Truman knew that they were Truman showing. But they were doing it for him as opposed to doing it for themselves, too. I get the feeling he thinks that even if he wasn't here, they would all be like that. Oh, they would all be like that, I think. Yes. Yeah. But I think he thinks that, too. I see. I, I thought that it was subverted in the sense that he's now he's wise to it. Um, okay, I see. But I, I see what you're saying. That's that's interesting. I like that too. Yeah, you're uh, right. Because when when Truman is not looking, they're hanging out and smoking and you know ha you know just playing on their phones or whatever, right? Yeah. Uh, not on their phones because it was the '90s, but you get it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but they're 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 doing this all the time because mm -hmm. they're all they're all simultaneously aware of the show and they're all Truman. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> I like that too. That's, that's a good one. Yeah. 
Uh, he is thinking about the self-knowledge that he's gaining, and one of the things he thinks is that the reason why not everybody asks a Keeper to tell them all the answers about themselves is that this would bring parts of themselves into conflict that were previously living in a more agreeable truce of ignorance. You might not survive as yourself if you could see yourself. I just thought that that was a really cool insight into human psychology. Do you think it's true? My, my immediate thought is, like... I remember how there was that brief period towards the end of the New Atheism Wars when they were like, we should call ourselves Brights instead. God, yes. So, you know, that. implying That's that everyone terrible. else is the Dims. Um, yeah, or, or, you know, I, I don't I think liked... they meant to imply that, but it was no. so cringy bad. Yeah. But, you know, in their defense, it was the early days and cringe was barely a word that meant what it means now. <laughs> so, that, you know, there's another thing that like that where it's like, well, you know, sure, you don't need religion, but, you know, these other people, they do because they couldn't get by without it. Um, mm -hmm. And there's something that seems like so... What do you call it when you're like being calling someone else childish, belittling, condescending, condescending? Thank or you, belittling too. Yeah, yeah, they both work. Um, and so I think that there must be some version of this that isn't condescending to people who don't like. Oh well, you can't face reality, but we, we keepers can. I, the closest I can think of is if everyone really understood in their bones uh, the elephant in the brain and they could see it, and like then... you're 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 aware that like. Like the reason that you're getting flowers for your girlfriend isn't just because you love her, but also because you want her to see that you love her. And it's important that she sees it. That's why you got the big ones. Um, right. That level of self-awareness might take some of the magic out of life or something. Yeah, but it's not like it's saying. not like people can't live with it. You know, I'm for standard deviation or some number of standard deviations uh, dumber than Keltham. And I, I can live with being able to see the elephant once in a while. Maybe the assertion is that, basically, that most people, if they saw that, would would not be able to survive it very well. There are, at least not just the same person they were. Yeah, you have to be, you're, you've got a different person, and there are uh, there are other psychological truths like that, right? You just you realize, oh, I guess this is just a truism of like who I am as a person. I guess we're coming down on yeah, that's probably true. Well, the thing is, is I don't I don't know anyone whose life has been ruined by any of this stuff, or you know right, who, who, but, who didn't survive it. Like no, 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 you would I mean bodily survive it, but he's saying survive as yourself. Like you would become a different person, a slightly different person. Yeah, but that, I mean, that happens every time you get a good night's sleep, you know, like, hmm. I, I to, to a less less dramatic degree, but, like... I think the, the difference is the more dramaticness of the degree. You read a good book, you become a different person, and it influences your thinking for the rest of your life, you know? like That's a good point. Do they hide all the good books? Like, I mean, what if one of the things that you are convinced by reading a good book is that there's no such thing as love... And you spend the rest of your life acting like a person who believes that. Then you read a bad book, but yeah, no, <laughs> you read you read a well written bad book. Um, well, but yeah, no, I point taken. Uh, there there might be ways of damaging people, but the thing is, uh, just to beat this a little longer, is hmm. uh, I don't think that's true. Okay. And so, like, if it is, then we're then we're not talking about the same phenomena. I think if if that's true, I think it's a deepity. It's profound if taken literally, but uh, it's like trivially false you know whatever like love is just a word right i i basically agree with all the things said except that that is not true i i don't know maybe it is true i i, I am not convinced one way or the other there's some phenomena that involves caring deeply about somebody and wishing them well and taking joy in their happiness and you know if, if the word love is not that then you know taboo it and find a different label uh, i mean i think you could permanently damage your ability to feel that if you're so fully convinced that it is just a neurochemical reaction meant to propagate your genes and really internalize that it might be some time before you back out of the damage that that does to you and one might even say that the way you fix that damage is by ignoring that and returning to the false belief that love is real or whatever okay i see what you're that's way of framing it yeah i i one that I can get behind is, you know, we're, we are actually vehicles for our genes uh, propagation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, to say we are just that is wrong. Um, okay. We, you know, we have, we are, we are more than that. But you're right. The way that I cope with that is I learned that and I thought that was, you know, interesting and then kind of disconcerting. And then I forgot about it for ten years. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like if maybe, maybe these are all gesturing in the right direction. But the thing is, these are all things we're all living with just fine. And I'd, I don't want to pat myself too hard on the back and say I'm probably a keeper then. Well, or it could be said that we're living with them just fine because we forget them and act as if we didn't know them. Exactly. We're okay with the uh, agreeable truce of ignorance. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for going down that rabbit hole with me. No, I enjoyed it. Thank you. I like this a lot, 
uh, he, he's then coming around to the fact that there's a constant drumbeat of hints that the people around him operate on a very alien and possibly inhumane morality. And he's been saying things to himself like Chris was probably making a joke he failed to get when she talked about tossing rats into a pit to cannibalize each other and selling tickets that people <laughs> uh, would pay to see it. Mm-hmm. There's a whole history of little pings like that and his brain pushing back at the dissonance with maybe it was a joke I didn't get. And he can see that now while he's got Al's wisdom running. Yeah. This is the kind of thing where like, uh, I, this, okay, that's the thing you were talking about earlier. Yeah. So a, yeah, he's coming. He's, I think he's getting wise to the fact that these might be evil people. Uh, mm-hmm. but also I just liked that th- this is like what a level up in wisdom does, right? Mm-hmm. This is an insight that he got, he understands he'll, he'll continue to understand when his wisdom drops, yeah. but he needed the bump to see it. Right. And he's like, oh yeah, you know, once, once is a joke, but now I'm seeing that I did this like eight times over the last two days yeah. and uh, that might be too many. Yeah. Yeah. How many Hitler jokes before it's not just a joke. You might actually be having dinner with a Nazi. Right. <laughs> oh. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll see. They still got their date night at some point. So they do. Uh, he says that he realizes now in Dothalan, he never would have had his 144 children. He would have tried to be special and failed and been sad and then maybe gotten an ordinary job and either paid for a child or decided he was too strange and unhappy to have one. And this made me really depressed to read. I was like, oh no. Oh, poor Keltham. No, please stop. Don't do this. Don't, don't give in yet to despair. And then he says it's okay for them not to shove themselves as hard as possible down the pathway that will dissolve the mistakes their current personality is built out of. Uh, he's not, in terms of like people, it's okay for people to flinch away from looking at this and realizing it. It's okay for them to continue on their happy hopes, thinking they'll maybe still matter someday in the future. He, he's, he's having a full on midlife crisis here, in my opinion. Well, because he's so smart, he's getting out of the way early. So, uh... <laughs> I mean, that's good, I guess. But... Or he's not long for this world, but... Uh, yeah. Quarter Life Crisis was the name of a good uh, stand-up special by Taylor Tomlinson. It's on Netflix. Um, cool. But, uh, yeah, I mean, part of me... I mean... I, like, I read that, and I, 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 get what you're, I get why you feel the sad vibes and stuff. Part yeah. of me felt that, like, uh, okay, I forgot he's a hormonal teenage boy. Mm. Like, oh, yeah, my life would have just sucked. You know, I'd have been too unhappy to have kids and too weird. It's like yeah. you know, as, as he's applying his his black lipstick and stuff, right? Like, right. Um, not putting the, I'm putting down the goth look. I'm just saying, like, no, it, no, it's, it it seems like he was. Uh, th- this seems like the kind of thought that every every or at least person. every kid I know goes through. You know, when they're going through whatever puberty. Um, yeah, he's supposed to be like 18. This is this his hormones are still rampant, right? Yeah, unless Othalon's fixed all that somehow, which I doubt, because that's kind of essential to being human, and they seem to want to leave a lot of that intact. Right. But yeah, it's okay for people not to shove themselves as hard as possible down the pathway that will dissolve their mistakes their current personality is built out of. I mean, it is okay for people not to do that, right? It's laudable when they do. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it's like, I don't know. I, I, I haven't had a midlife crisis really as far as I think I wouldn't. I don't know if I'd be. T- have I had one? You've known me for a while. Not much. When you have, when you have one, you will know it. I figured. So yeah, I, to the extent that I've had one, it's been mild if it's been there at all um but i could imagine somebody looking back you know like oh man you know if i had done this differently well it's not too late i could actually just throw my phone in the river you know burn my social security card and ditch my family and go do the thing i wanted to do when i was you know 18 uh but you know i'm okay settling for this because i am actually you know enjoying it uh maybe that's what he's saying right yeah because it's like you don't have to like you know even if you realize that you'd rather be doing something else you don't have to rip up what you're doing and go do that well i I don't think that always a crisis ends with you or results in you detonating your life like that. I think most people just have the crisis and deal with it and continue living, but give up on the greater dreams. Uh, They give up on the illusion that they will be special and important in the history of the world. And uh, for that reason, you know, they aren't, but Uh, see, that that was my secret. I realized that that 10 years ago. Right. It's a brute fact that the overwhelmingly vast majority of humanity will not matter in history, right? So it's it's kind of silly to think that you will. And yet I think everybody does think that at first. And at some point you realize that actually, no, I, I'm not gonna. We won't be, most of us won't be in history books, but we'll always have mattered to the people that we were close to, you know? 
I realize this is digging into meaning talk, but so is this whole well, I mean, crisis. Exactly. I, I, and I think that is the most common way that the crisis resolves. Then I, I, you know, I skipped the end of it a long time ago then. I'm sure I'll still have something probably, but uh, yeah. if, if at the end I end up right back where I am now, then I feel like I, I'm doing a pretty good job. Um, but I, mean, I, I, I hear what you're end, saying. You know, yeah. maybe I'll eventually, whatever, buy a stupidly expensive car or something. You know, that, that's another way these it, things these things resolve, right? Yeah, it, I don't know. You, you I, get a divorce, feels... you, you marry a hot 20-year-old, you know, by giving her lots of money with your new Ferrari and stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah, I... I, I don't know. <laughs> I feel bad for him for, for going through this right now. Like just Well the thing he's, is he, he's eighteen. He shouldn't have to go through this yet, damn it. But the thing is is he's he's not exactly going through it. He's saying, Well, in my previous life I might have not had a good time. But here I'm gonna fucking kill it. That's true. Maybe this is all cope to deal with being in this world now. I, I don't even know because he's had most of these thoughts before. Like um you know, it before he even talked about like, you know, oh yeah, well, was I gonna like get deterred and you know say woe is me? No, I was gonna pick myself up and kick ass here, right? Mm -hmm. Something something to that effect he said a few weeks ago. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of what he's doing here. And before he's like, he came really wise. Yeah, he's even said on Dothalon he wouldn't have had his 144 kids. I I know he said that at some point. I think what he's realizing here is he's maybe coming to emotional grips with that. The thing is, is like he's not on Dothalon anymore. Like whatever whatever woe was me he's having there isn't his circumstance yeah it doesn't apply here i think i think what it's getting at all around here is just like what it's like to look at your life with with a higher wisdom score than you're used to running around with which i think is a depressing thing to do yeah, th they could have his pros and cons as he's thinking about this he says you do not need to rush ahead to be a keeper if you'd rather be a little less coherent a little more yourself and your mistakes and your contradictions a little more human for a time uh, this reminded me immediately of what Carissa said about Keltham having not a lot of free will and coming from a place without free will. He's far less incoherent than everybody in Galarian, and he doesn't have so many contradictions and flaws that make him, as he says, a little more human. I think that's what we're getting into here with a uh, free will, concept of free will is, right? It seems like that might be what they're getting at, yeah. Keepers being completely coherent and completely aware of all the forces shaping them have the least free will of the humans in Dothalon. They've done the uh, the forged by fires of hell, except they skipped the hell part. Yeah. I'd like to see a keeper show up in Cheliax and see what they make of him. Wouldn't that be great? Maybe he'll have like a flashback mm. to talking to one or something. Cool. Uh, he's thinking, uh, it's not so much that people are encouraged to lie to themselves, reality forbid, but the people are told it's okay for them to not just shove themselves as hard as possible down the pathway. Um, oh, you, you read that one, but I just liked the reality forbid. That's why I pulled that out. Oh, okay, cool. Because heavens forbid yeah. is, a, is a phrase we have here on Earth. Right. But it's, it's just kind of like, oh yeah, eh, Dothalon. They obviously don't have any religious um, talk in their, not euphemisms, but um, not slaying. Colloquialisms, yeah. Uh, so he thinks about the uh, singer's drowning child in a pool thing. It says, it's a parable calculated to set two pieces of yourself at odds. Uh, and he's thinking about the time that the Watcher taught this to them all as a child. Your flaw is not that you made the wrong choice between the two pieces. It was that you hammered one of those pieces down in a way that would leave it feeling small and injured and unable to speak in its own defense. You failed to understand and notice a kind of outside assault on your own internal integrity. I really like this thing, and it feels like a good steel man of the anti-singer position. The EAs are doing something bad to themselves by being so scrupulous that they hurt a part of themselves. I, it maybe is because I've fully drank that Kool-Aid and again, it doesn't taste good, but once you get it down, you know, you realize it was the right thing to drink, but. Mm. So it's like the opposite of the Kool-Aid. Because right. the Kool-Aid does taste good, but when you drink it, you're like, oh shit, it's poison. Yeah, so I, I drank the Bizarro Kool-Aid and <laughs> the reason people don't like the thought experiment, and I loved it, like all the modifications on it that he had to keep putting parenthetically, like, you know, it got past the safety things and this was a dangerous area, yada, yada. Because otherwise it wouldn't make sense and kids would be like, that's not how the world works. Exactly. Nobody just drowns. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the real reason people say they'll say fuck you for asking is because they don't want to. The, the implication of the thought experiment is that there are drowning kids. They're just not drowning. They're just not next to you. And I think those people might be the ones who are like, fuck you for trying to hammer that piece of me down and cause me to self injure in that way. I mean, because at the end of it, you become more caring to people who aren't around you, which I, I don't think is self injuring. But I'm also somebody who's been possibly injured that way so if i'm like join us it's great it's probably because uh you know i'm brain damaged from having fully bought into this 
But I don't think it does make you more caring to the people around you. I think it's only effective if you already care about people around you and it forces you into a way of acting that maybe maybe is desirable, but also maybe not and could have some further bad effects based on what Cheltenham is saying here. Maybe. It all seems like a little bit pat on the back for like, at the end of it, the whole class is wrong and he's right. And Obama is there and gives him a crisp hundred dollar bill and says <laughs> like, you know, you were the only one who saw through this. Good job, right? Um, uh -huh. And so it it seems like, and his objections weren't even like, hey, this, necessi this necessitates that I ruined my whole fucking life to save all these kids. His disagreement was that, well, society should fix the problem. They, mm -hmm. sh they should let me build the parents' insurance for my pants. And uh -huh. if, if society won't let me do that, well, it's society's problem, not mine. That's all well and good until like it's your kid in the pond. And somebody is like, well, you know, because your insurance wouldn't cover it, I, I figured, you know, these are nice shoes. Uh, <laughs> sure, but he's he isn't being brought out as an example to the other kids in order to say you were wrong about what you wanted to do. They're saying specifically you were right, but the thing that happened that is bad is that you hammered down the piece of yourself that was sad about the shoes and wanted to do something about it and made it so that it couldn't even speak in its self-defense. You crushed a little bit of yourself and pretended it was great to do that. Hmm. I feel like there are cases where that's totally the right approach, though. Like, if you are raised in a racist community, mm -hmm. uh, that becomes who you are. You know, you're 20. You've been a racist for several years, right? Mm -hmm. As long as you've been sapient. And okay. uh, you're realizing at some point, through good argument, that, oh, you know what? We're all the same model of car running on different coats of paint on. It makes no fucking difference. Mm -hmm. You would have to crush part of yourself to accept that, right? It's not It's not the integrity of holding on to who you are in that case is actually the stupid move. Hmm. I see what you're saying. I, I think it's just like that That sort of... So Keltham might fully be right here. Like I, I'm not going to say like whatever, everyone should save the drowning kid, right? Um, mm -hmm. I... I do think I think that, but I, 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 that's not even the hill I'm going to fight on here. I'm going to just say that the general defense of, well, you failed to, like, uh, or y you actually resisted stamping down part of yourself to, uh, you know, cohere to this, what we're, what we're pushing down your throats. Uh, I don't think that that's always an admirable thing to do. I think it would be good in the, like, the racism example to acknowledge that that is what you are doing and that uh, that, that is desirable to like to be mindful of it as opposed to simply doing it out of instinct and out of fear of being called immoral you know oh okay yes i i totally agree i remember when i first read diamond affluence and morality where this essay came or where this thought experiment came from i was in a philosophy class in college and i like wrote we had to like write a response short essay about it and i don't remember all of it but i remember it like because i i had to like actually articulate the thoughts and feelings i was having while reading it right Yep. Uh, which is like, you know, the five stages, you know, denial, <laughs> bargaining, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. And at the end of it, it's like, well, you know, I, I remember something along the lines of my closing bit there was that maybe all of my like resistance to it is the fact that I just don't want to give up my Bugatti, which was the nice car example that he gave in the essay. But um, mm. like, you know, it, I can't think of a good reason why any, I, I can't, I don't have any knockdown things against any of the points P Singer brought up here. Uh, yeah. but I, I find myself repelled by them. And mm -hmm. then as you do, when you're an, ex you know, an excited young, you know, person who's introduced to philosophy, you like start talking to people about it and then they get incensed mm -hmm. when, when you bring up the drowning pond thing and they're like, well, what does he give away all his money? And like, that's actually not the point. And, uh, but, but people, they, they see it as an attack on their integrity, uh, on their, on their personhood. Right. Right. Um, because, you know, because the thing is they are good people. They just don't, they just don't donate any or a lot of their money. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think that they see the, you're right, the, the incentive is different. That's what I was trying to get at here is that okay. uh, on the one hand, you know, the, the person who says, you're right, I am deliberately crushing this racist part of my brain. I was dumb and now I'm not, now I'm less dumb. That is different than saying, well, I, I, I don't want to feel bad. Okay. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll also put money into the, the collections dish. Is that what they call it when they pass that plate around at church? I imagine some people sitting in church doing this. And I, I've been to a church that did this a handful of times in my life, less than five. I feel the same thing every single time I go to like, I don't know, a Chipotle. <laughs> and there's a tip line on the receipt after I pay with my card. I'm like, why? Why? No, I'm not going to be pressured into this, but I still feel bad, you know? 
they have these like gas stations now too. I'll rant for 30, 10 seconds. And it's like, yeah. look, I got a drink. I brought it to the counter myself. Why am I tipping you? This this sucks. Yeah. And don't get me wrong. Right. I, I lived on tips for years. It's important. It, it sucks that it is important. It shouldn't be, but it's, it's getting out of control. The business owners are exploiting this nonsense. The big difference though, it, between that and that fits more closely with the Keltham thing is that it, at church, you get to see the person, you know, who's just handed you the plate. You just watch them put in, you know, money. And then right. if you just pass it on, the people, the person that you pass it to will see you have not done it, right? Mm -hmm. You are like visibly the asshole to like your direct peers in a way that, and publicly, right? Right. Whereas if you, if you just hit the no tip or whatever thing on the 7-Eleven checkout thing, the only person who might actually see that is the cashier. You're not embarrassing yourself in front of people you care about. What if the, you went in with somebody? Then you tip. Like. <laughs> see this is exactly why you need to be a keltham so that you have the balls to stand by your principles <laughs> we'll, we'll see if he sticks by his principles when the prospect of not having sex you know comes comes around right <laughs> right um, anyway all right so yeah he's thinking about this and as you were saying like the whole obama shows up and gives him a hundred dollar bill and all that he does say dothalon had acknowledged that the alien in their midst might have his uses which i was like cool and then he goes on a bit later to say, like making it slightly easier to demonstrate a useful children's lesson to a class full of the smarter and more altruistic kids who would actually grow up to matter. I was like, oh, dude, like I, I heard that joke. Everybody has a purpose in life. Yours is to serve as a warning for others. Uh, the, oh, man, that, that, that was harsh. Wait, was it to serve as a warning? I thought they said that he was right. It no, I mean the answer is still to save the child. It was he was there to make one lesson that he happened to be correct on in, in the fact that you should stand up and not crush down that piece of yourself. He, he's there oh, as a so as the, an object. The whole point of like, this that wasn't the, to say that like Keltham was right and everyone else was wrong. Uh, it was to say here's a good example of you know not stand or, you know standing up for your beliefs or whatever. Unfortunately, he's standing on, you know, a stupid place to stand and, you know, he's a bad person for doing it. Yeah, well, and also that, like, even if it is that he is, he's right, he's saying, like, his purpose in life was to be right that one time so that other people could learn from that one thing he's right on and go on to actually do useful things. He passes the butter. <laughs> yeah, this this is, uh, this, this very, this, this ran past me as just, like, him being, you know, I'm an 18, I'm a sad 18-year-old kid. Uh, yeah. I don't think it really feels this way. You know, I, I get it. You know, he's looking back on this, but I, I feel like he's probably missed part of the point that Dothalon was doing that for. If they're half as sane as he's letting us believe that they are, it's interesting that the owl's wisdom makes him much more depressed because he can see reality. And you keep <laughs> you keep saying that, like, yeah, well, that's dumb. He shouldn't be depressed. And I'm like, I, I, I can't say you're wrong. Like, he shouldn't be depressed is the correct answer to everyone for everything always. But man, I feel I feel very much on his side emotionally that introspecting about things just leads to depression. I, this is a problem with with being depressed. I mean, as somebody who's also taking, you know, who's been whatever diagnosed and been taking drugs for depression for years, I yeah, I, I can have times where I introspect and I feel way better at the end of it. Really? Yeah. Okay. You know, especially like if I if I'm if I realize I'm holding on to like a negative thing. And yeah. I, I can realize there, there have been times where I'm like, you know what? It's actually not fair for me to be doing this to the person that I'm upset with. Okay. So I, I really just need to stop. And I do. Yeah. Um, you know, like they're, they're, and sure, maybe I'm thinking about a negative thing or something, but that's not exactly like with a high wisdom. That's just kind of like reflecting. I, yeah. I also just want to reject the idea without having ever taken a wisdom, wisdom enhancing drug that doing that would immediately make you depressed. Because I, I do not think yeah. that, I don't, I don't think that wisdom and depression are, are the same thing. And they, they, People conflate this all the time, right? Oh, that's why smart people are depressed yeah. all the time and stuff, right? I reject that. I think that you can be smart and happy. Either right. other, otherwise, I because I try to be happy, and if I succeed, it'll mean that I'm stupid. That is correct. Yes. Well, uh, mm -hmm. it, that that one should not think that way and right. push against. Yeah, my reasoning yeah. is correct, not my conclusion. <laughs> uh, I mean, and possibly your conclusion too, honestly. Well, I, I sure hope not. That smartness does not make you depressed. Oh yeah, is what I meant. Oh yeah, because I was saying otherwise, that would mean that if I succeed at being happy, that means I'm an idiot. Uh, oh no 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 yeah. not that one gotcha the one before that <laughs> yeah all right well i agree then okay 
Good. High five. Yay! Yay. All right. Anyways, Keltham starts wondering why they didn't warn him that this is what happens when Owl's Wisdom gets cast on you. <laughs> and... Why no one tell me this was a sadness spell? <laughs> <laughs> and he thinks the thing like, maybe they just have so little internal stuff going on that they don't have self-reflection. But then like, he's like, that, that can't be right. I think it's just that they don't have the luxury of self-reflection because they're just freaking trying to survive. And prob maybe like some of them end up like... um like broom where hmm. they just become their masks but i think a lot of them just like you don't have time to self-reflect when you're just trying to live through the day without getting set on fire it's true and then when you do get set on fire you've got nothing but to nothing to do but reflect <laughs> on I, all the pain that you're in right well I, I bring this up because every every person whose head we've been in actually is full of self-reflection mm, that's a good point like uh the high priestess knows exactly what she's doing and why right yeah uh, ione same thing carissa yeah. same thing uh, granted, these are all smart people. Maybe he's thinking of like the rest of them, but they're all everyone in his harem is supposed to be smart, right? Maybe they all just naturally have a much higher wisdom score than he does. It could be that, or it could just be there's some level of practice, or maybe they are all sad all the time. You know, mm. for for real, their circumstances suck. So right, <laughs> they are in hell. Yeah. Well, they they really want to be. They're they're one step away. But it's not just sadness. See. To him, like the uh, having the additional capacity for self reflection has suddenly made a lot of things change in his personality that weren't there before. And he, he saw possibly this, you know, subverted Truman show. Yeah. And he's like, wouldn't they realize that I would see this? It seems like dumb of them to say that, like, hey, by the way, you know, you might, uh, you might realize you've been fucking with you this whole time or that this whole place is weird. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe there's just no way to stop him safely. You know, he, he runs down that line of thought for a moment, but doesn't have time to chase it too far. Yeah. Uh, do you think you would be changed drastically if an Owl's Wisdom was cast on you and you could do a lot more self-reflection and wisdom thinking? Yeah, probably. I feel like I practice at it now. You know, I don't know. A lot of what Kelton does is self-reflection. I, I feel is like I'm not halfway as good at, at that. But I guess I have to assume that whatever wiser me would see things that current me totally can't. So that sounds a lot like maybe admitting that the changes people go through as they age is because they're getting wiser. I think that's definitely part of it. Reflecting and updating. Oh, okay. I mean, it hard. It, I think it'd be hard to get through life without getting any wiser at all. Uh, yeah, not impossible. You know, counter examples aplenty. But yeah, uh, yeah. I think that that's that's part of what you know. That's why people go to their grandparents for advice in you know the movies, right? That's why you've got the mm -hmm. wise old wizard, mm -hmm. and not like the the spry young wizard who is your is your <laughs> wise advisor. Did you see the Dungeons and Dragons movie yet? Yes. Oh, I love the spry young wizard they had in that one. And he was not their go-to source of wisdom. <laughs> no, he was not. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, the, what, what I was hoping for and the movie didn't do? Hmm. Was uh, Level Up. Oh, that would have been cool. That would have been cool. But they didn't really have game mechanics as a huge part of the of the movie. No, I mean, they talked about like, you know, skill level and stuff. But yeah, it didn't lean super heavy into that. It was more just like a fun story set in D&D &D land, not here's D, &D yeah. the movie yeah 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 it, it it was not super meta and crunchy <laughs> i would have enjoyed that but you know i got that in book form instead so exactly uh but yeah as he's thinking about why they didn't warn him he says he gets annoyed maybe injured on some level that there weren't some warning signs he thought that he was getting a perception boost or a plus one sd <laughs> and not this and yeah just just a reminder that drugs are powerful do your due diligence before you do them, because uh, I, I don't want anybody saying that they didn't get warnings from from you and me that these are powerful shits and you maybe don't want to use them. Yeah, 100%. Uh, I want to admonish as much as possible. And this isn't just like the boring old, you know, dry old concerns that everyone always gives when it comes to drugs. Like, it, it's serious business. Be careful. Yeah. Uh, and that includes hormones. I just want to say hormones are some incredibly powerful drugs and also not to be taken lightly. So also do due dil dil diligence on those. Yeah, it's weird that like it could be a thing that your brain already has, and then you take more of it, and it totally fucks with you, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that's that's how it is. Uh, even the hormones that you get just out of the factory also sometimes are too much or suck, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Wait, do you think Especially you'd change a lot with an Alice Wisdom? I would have to assume I would change it some. I don't think I would change as much as Keltham is changing, because I've probably had a lot more time to be hit over the head with some of these things. Um, that's a good I, point. Our end score is already higher than his, or excuse me, our wisdom score. <laughs> right. Just because wisdom score is actually helped by the passage of time a fair bit, as long as you're paying attention and growing. I think so. Um, yeah, but 
if I got another one SD of wisdom just on top of what I got now, probably. I feel like it'd be hubris of me to like, say that I wouldn't change, but I, I obviously don't know how I would change. I, uh, yeah, because if we knew we wouldn't do it, like I, I kind of suspect right now, one of the first things I would do is just delete all my social media accounts and be like, <laughs> dude, Inias, you fucking idiot. You know, this is an issue. Why do you keep doing it? But the fact that I can think of that right now makes me think that that is not the first thing I would think of. I don't know. Maybe, maybe YZ would actually just do it. <laughs> it could be. I mean, if I was wiser, I would probably move my Nintendo Switch further from my work computer. Um, <laughs> but that, this, this problem will solve itself in a couple more weeks. And I, you know, I have finished playing Tears of the Kingdom. So, yeah. So, sadly, neither of them is hyped for the di date with each other anymore. Both uh, Keltham and Chris have gone through a lot of life changes. And, like, yeah, obviously that would make you not as hyped for a date because now you got something different vying for all that attention. Yeah. I, this was funny. He's like, he is still himself. He should still have the parts of himself that are hyped for the date with Carissa. Being hit mm -hmm. with a temporary spell should not have changed those internal parts. Uh, yada, yada, yada. But like, he didn't just get wise. He wised up and noticed that something was wrong. That should absolutely mm -hmm. dampen his hype, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know why because he's like, well, this, this shouldn't have changed me. It's like, the, you know, the wisdom didn't change you. The insight did. Right. You know, the, the, the insight that like, maybe she's a psychopath who thinks that people would actually buy tickets to a rat cannibalism show, right? Right. Well, I mean, and even if there wasn't any insight about Carissa specifically maybe being a psychopath, just all of a sudden having another huge thing can can alter your your priorities like that. Yeah, totally. Like if I were to find out, I don't know, that my one of my parents has cancer or something, I would still have that part of me that's super hyped for a date with Carissa. But the sudden change in things I got to focus on would make me less focused on the date and more on like, oh, shit, here's this other thing in my life now. He thinks of this after the wisdom drops off, right? Yeah. Yeah. And this makes sense because that's, that's a pretty unwise thing to, to for him to be lamenting on. <laughs> I suppose so. Because maybe this is the first time he's ever had something serious like this happen, right? Uh, I, I It can't be guess. the first time because the first time was like at least two days ago when he showed up here. But yeah. uh, like, you know, having your priorities reshuffled because something more important came up. And like, yeah. you know, it doesn't make the thing less important. It just makes it lower on your list because something more important came up. Yes, but I also think that's not the entirety of what they're talk of what he's talking about here, because as he's saying, like now his self is in a weird internal state of strife that is preventing him from having fun, and he's also worried that it might prevent him from ever having any fun again. He thinks that keeper would tell him this is not a great way to get smashed and rearranged. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not just necessarily a thing of a new thing has taken prior uh, has taken your attention. It's like I I have change the internal parts of me are different now and i am worried about what i find fun and important anymore and the fact that i'm not hyped about this date with carissa is a maybe a sign that i have internally changed like that he says uh there's a lot to be said for trying to snap out of this and go back to his normal and then only change one piece of himself at a time from there in response to new facts about galarian as he learns them because keltham has not pre-cached any other sensibly configured ways to be this was induced by a temporary state of perception, and he can't go back and access it again. Like, this reading today hit me kind of uh, harder than, well, than any of the other ones, because like, this is disturbingly close to my experience with Inner Peace last year, where I, I had this new state of being that I was in for a couple months, and it drastically arranged things. And then when, like, I snapped out of that, I was like, well, fuck. Now what do I do? I guess I go back to being how I was and try to change something slowly a piece at a time because I have not been able to go back and access that. And it's it's a weird way to exist. I can relate a bit. Uh, and this this is probably one of those things where an admonishment to not to don't do drugs comes up. But this is a lot like uh, my experience having been on MDMA and then not being on it. Oh, really? Because it, it's, especially when you take it with, with like a partner, you know, there's, there's, there can be, this isn't like a guaranteed outcome, a circumstance where like you both are able to communicate with parts of yourselves and then communicate them to each other in ways that like, it's not like you can't do outside of it, but you just feel safer doing it mm -hmm. and it lets you sh like short circuit, like a lot of that nonsense and just could actually just straight, straight to stuff. Every time I take it, I have a sore throat the next morning from talking too much. It's been a long time since I've, since I've had it, but it's like that, that's an expected outcome now. But the, uh, so, it's like, oh, I can just do this, you know, in a week from now. It'll be easy. But, like, it's somehow not. Yeah. And it's weird because it's like, but now I know what I'm trying to do. It's like, yeah, but still. 
I think that's that's different from from your experience, but it's it's reminiscent of it. Uh, yeah. What's good is that you know there's again there's nothing to say that you can't put it in one piece at a time, right? Now you just have to do it rather than have it happen to you. But the other thing is that Kelton says that there's no way to go back. It's like this is a spell you did. <laughs> you, you do it again tomorrow night, right? Yeah, I guess he could. It just seems weird of him to say that he can't go back and access that state again. You're right. He absolutely can. <laughs> There's magic. More than anyone else in history, he can. Right. So maybe next time he takes it, he'll realize that next time he takes it, next time he has this spell, <laughs> he'll, he'll realize that was a dumb thought to have. Maybe he's never going to cast the spell again because he's been so spooked by this. That doesn't seem wise either, but that is a thing that actually is probably a Dathalani thing that stuck with him and is probably wise that when you take a drug, sometimes you're like, I should do this more often. And that's actually not a wise thought to have. Mm -hmm. So maybe maybe he is right. They're like, you know what? I'm going to not do this, at least until I'm sure or something, right? Um, yeah, yeah. That might be a smart thing for him to, to do. Yeah, lay off, make it a, you know, two, three times a year kind of thing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Christmas, spring break, and sometime in, you know, the fall. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right. So we get back to the, the Haramites and... Uh, Oh, yeah, they're all looking at Ione because they're like, the fuck with all that book business? Forbiddance, uh, I'm not sure if you looked it up, but in addition to preventing any tele teleportation in or out, people who are in a different alignment from the person that cast it take damage if they enter the area. People who were already in the area when it is cast aren't affected, but if they leave and re-enter, then they take damage. So <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. And it makes me wonder, because like, taking damage when you're playing D&D, &D, you know, you lost two hit points. Right. What the hell does it look like? You know, is she walking and suddenly like, her just nose starts bleeding and her ankle really hurts? Like, <laughs> <laughs> maybe I, I assume it's some kind of like intense inner pain and you fall down and then like maybe you die from it or maybe you have to go have bed rest for several days as you heal up something. Depends on how high, you, how much HP you have. Yeah, what your, yeah uh, how badly you roll. What's what's the HP stat? Don't tell me. Uh, constitution. Yes. Right. All right. Nerd point for me. Yeah, but the uh, one of the girls says, you know what? Go outside, outside the Forbiddens, and come back in to prove to us that you're still loyal. And she says, you know what? No. Sure, if an expert says that getting touched by Nethys didn't change my alignment uh, for Forbiddens purposes, I'll walk out and back if the actual security here tells me I should. That's cool, because just... Earlier in this chapter, there was that rich son racing rhinos thing where they were doing it entirely for comedy. I didn't think this would be relevant to the story so soon, but he was telling his son, you don't accept dares just because someone says, prove to me you're the kind of person who'd race a rhino. You, that, that lets you get tricked into doing all sorts of stupid shit just because someone says, oh, I bet you're too, too much of a chicken to do it. This is a direct application of that. She's like, you know what? I'll walk back out and in if uh, security tells me I should, but I'm not going to do it just because you said I should do it. I'm not racing rhinos and shit. I love that you drew the connection. I didn't at all. Um, I, I thought she was just being prudent. Because at first she's like, it doesn't matter. It's not It's not about uh, God allegiance. It's about alignment, dumbass. But yeah, sure, I'll do it if I'm told to by like someone who actually matters. Mm -hmm. um, but no, you're right. It's, you know, sh you know, like the reason you and I don't crash our cars because people at the streetlight or people next to us at the stoplight rev their engines is because we saw the Back to the Future trilogy. <laughs> right? Sure, yeah. And that is wisdom, learning from other people's mistakes. That's at least part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and they just went through this, this, this exercise and it's like, aha, I know now that I don't have to say, what are you, chicken? The answer isn't always, fuck you, I'll do it, right? Yeah. In yeah. Fact, that's the wrong answer to give. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, that's solid. That was awesome. Yeah. Uh, Paxty immediately, well, not immediately, but before anyone else does the thing where she's like, ah, I think someone's worshiping a false god in our midst uh, to report his security. I kind of like that, says, which, which what, part? How that was delivered. Because okay. it was right after, I don't mean to interrupt, but it was right after Ione says, look, I got chosen by, Neth by Nethus. I, it wasn't because I wanted to. It was just, I think he cut a deal with Asbodian, whatever, or Asbodius. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there's an astonished silence. And then she's just like, security. I'm I'm obliged to report evidence of forbidden primary worship, even if I think you have it already. Mm -hmm. uh, which is great. Because like, I the, the level of fear that they constantly live under with, you know, torture and Asmodeus and all this stuff. Yeah. She's just like, I, I I need I need to tell I need I need to go get a grown up like we 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 yeah. need this th this is serious it it just it felt tense and awesome I just all wanted heresy to, to draw attention to that yeah all heresy must be reported immediately right yeah yeah it was it was great and I I loved that demonstration because like this is how evil regimes work they anyone who is slow to denounce the any enemies of the regime are immediately punished as well just for like not being fast enough to denounce 
Well, they, and, uh, they actually are punished. Yes, yeah. they, they actually they are right here. And uh, that's that's awful. And uh, it's a really good thing. There's no political movements like that in real life right now. I mean, not where you specifically get told to go around and slap people, but there I, definitely I am, are, right? I was saying that with an intense amount of sarcasm. Oh, I see. I missed it. Mm. Yeah. I have a, a one of my coworkers on my team is, is English isn't his first language. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember, it came up sometime this week or last week, and he's like, I don't have a great grasp of sarcasm. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, I'll be sure to flag it, like, for sure every time then. Um, cool, yeah. But it's, uh, uh, yeah, that went right over my head. Um, it can be harder to tell when we're not in the same room and not looking at each other. Or if I'm just totally missing what you're putting down. <laughs> <laughs> or that, yes. But yeah, so, so like, most of the security is busy investigating this dead bird that crashed into the window, which is just kind of funny. Um and then Elias, you know, our, our favorite torturing maniac, uh, is just like, all right, Paxi, slap the other rest of them for being too slow in reporting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, what an encouragement to, to be faster next time for everybody, right? Absolutely. And so she goes around, she hits everybody way harder than is necessary. And it's like this kind of like, do I hit as hard as I can? Do I hit them like not hard enough? Because like, it, everything is this. So when we're talking, I, it's not exactly self-reflection as much as it is self-awareness, mm -hmm. but like, that level of, of self-awareness is not something most people have to think about, right? She, mm -hmm. She's sitting there thinking of the game theoretic implications of how hard she has to hit these people. Yeah. Right? It, it was really well done. It was. It was great. Is Do you think... I kind of suspect that the bird that hit the window is not just a bird that hits the window. I I have no good guess. I was going to say 50-50, but I... I don't even want to like, assign a number to it because it, it total it's it's equally plausible to me that they're all distracted by this total non thing, yeah. Because uh, that that'd be funny, and you know non things happen all the time, yeah. Uh, yeah. Or or you know it was some secret thing, and they're they're out there puzzling out a real mystery. Well, I mean, the law of narrative economy would say that you don't mention something that never happens to matter in any way at all. But on the other hand, maybe. Every now and then you got to throw something in there to throw the reader off, right? It, it could just be one of those, this just the thing that happened, you know? Not a big deal. It's just well, very and, suspicious of this bird. And it, and it would matter in the sense that it tells us that, they're, that, they take, that they take every possible event super seriously, right? There we go. So yeah, it, it still it even fits in the narrative much. economy, even if it's a non-incident. Right. That's, yep, good point. So I, I honestly have no idea. Th that bird could have been Nethys himself, or it could have been <laughs> just a bird. <laughs> I think it's sus. It might be. Well, maybe our our favorite halfling, maybe maybe Broom will uh, go make sure it's super dead. Dude, speaking of Broom, Ione at this point is thinking to herself that she's someone who, uh, well, she's thinking it's good that the other girls will think that sometimes she gives security advisories that's going to help her. But uh, she says, she's thinking, which obviously she absolutely will never abuse for anything Charlie's security would not in fact like. She is a very good and cooperative Oracle of Nethys. And like this is something she's thinking to herself, but she's obviously thinking it for the mind readers, right? That's the motivation for these thoughts. And the thing is, they must also know that it's obviously for them, but they don't care or they expect it. Like they just, as long as the thoughts are happening, that's good enough for them, which probably means they think that just thinking these things is enough to influence you eventually to make you the kind of person they want. So they don't care if like you mean it or not. It still works. And it's, I think maybe it does, as we see with Broom. I think you're right. And I mean, I think that works with people, too. Um, yeah. It's, you know, it there, there's a level where uh, fake it till you make it actually works. Yeah. The church doesn't care if you believe the words you say or not in the prayer. As long as you say them, eventually it gets through. And especially as long as you're tithing. Yeah, yeah, that and too. And I'm not, I'm not just saying that as a dig at the church. I'm saying that for also, also for this, right? They, they take their loyalty mm -hmm. inspections, which are probably just deep mind reading sessions. Mm -hmm. And if they're like, all right, you have an acceptable bound of like, uh, whatever thoughts that maybe this is all bullshit or you hate us or whatever, right? Yeah. You don't have an, you don't have so much of those that we're going to kill you, but you know, you're, you're towing the line, try and rein that shit in. And if we don't see yeah. you more scared the next time you come in, we're going to actually really hurt you more. Um, right. Ooh. Yeah. I think, I think that shit totally happens here. Yeah. Keep the fear level constantly high enough yeah um well speaking of that yeah so this is where she she and elias get to have uh well it actually turned out to be a pretty fruitful showdown i thought it was just going to be you know another sad thing like her getting her eye gouged out um mm -hmm. instead he politely tells her to remove her clothes because he's going to set her on fire and it'd be inconvenient to replace them uh, yeah and then it's just metal as fuck i get it like wizards or whatever are more robust against damage than muggles mm -hmm. um but 
and and true of this too. I know I'm using Harry Potter language, but um, she just goes over afterwards and puts her clothes back on. Yeah, I don't care what kind of fire you were just put on, but you were you're pulling your clothes on. You're pulling your skin off. Yeah, yeah. So she's. I think she's just. Some, maybe that's something to occupy her for a moment or just give her a second. Yeah, I think it was to give her a second to try and compose herself or something, but that's just metal as fuck. Like she was on fire for 10 seconds. And I know that you can be on fire for at least one or two seconds without any serious damage. Yeah, I mean, you can, I don't know. You can, you can run over coals. You can run your hand through through a bonfire. Like, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know like if your skin is necessarily coming off when you put on your clothes if you've only been on fire for 10 seconds. 10 seconds is a long time. Oh, it's long enough to cause damage and intense pain. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's enough to like have your skin start slowing off. I, I mean, this all depends on how hot the fire is and how magic it is, right? Um, yeah, that's a good know, point. Because a two second okay. contact with a stove, and you know that skin's ripped off, right? Right. Uh, yep. But you know, it is this candle hot or is this stove top hot? Uh, right. Good, we good we can be sure it's it's the maximum amount of hot that you can get before it starts to burn off your nerve endings and hurt less. So yeah, someone yeah. probably knows that temperature and can tell us. But <laughs> oh. um, yeah. Anyway, it, this was uh, this is really cool. I I didn't really bring any notes to. The, I guess I brought just yeah one at the end about broom um, from the beginning to end of this because because yeah. you basically pull everything I wanted to. So uh, okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll dive into it as much as you'd like. Oh, dude, when it when it first started out and he's like you. You, you know, telling her to take off her clothes, he wants uh, you to submit to him and you aren't doing that. I was like, oh my God, bad shit is going to happen. The, I, Yeah, like from the very beginning, this was a scene that I knew was going to be shitty and intense. Yeah, unless you're in a doctor's office, being told to take your pants off is de- de- probably going to end badly if someone that you don't really know is telling you to do it. So, And, and if they tell you so I can set you on fire. <laughs> uh, um then Anyways. you might be in a literal hellscape. Yeah. He tells her that if it serves Asmodeus for you to live, then you don't have to fight like a rabid seagull to give us reason to keep you breathing because the incentives are already there. If it serves Asmodeus for you to die, then none of these games will work. And if you're unpredictable enough, then at some point it will serve us for you to die. He makes a compelling argument here. He does. And it was interesting because I thought, you know, in my mind, I was in, I was modeling him kind of like Ione has been, right? Mm-hmm. As like, these guys are definitely the enemy. They're going to kill me. Like I said, I, th- mm-hmm. I, th- I, th- I thought they just killed the halfling when he was oracled, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but he's like, look, we have protocols for this. Come talk to us. It's the fact that you keep trying to leverage this against us. That's why we're escalating. That's why you lost an eye for, you know, an hour this afternoon. That's why you're going to be set on fire. Um, mm-hmm. And I think he's probably right. Or rather, I think that he's probably not lying. Um, yeah. The thing is, is that, hey, look, it's not my fault. Your guys' fucked up society taught me that the way to not get set on fire is to lie to you fucks. Or or yeah. not, not lie, because that doesn't work because you guys are reading my mind, but to leverage my advantages, right? Right, yeah. If I didn't if I didn't come to you guys be like, hey, by the way, I, should, I thought I should tell you. Uh, maybe it's because, you know, the last time I raised my hand asking a question in school, someone cut it off, right? Yeah. So right. Uh, I, I, I want to emphasize again, this place sucks. <laughs> they're doing it wrong yeah. even, even for their own ends right yeah Th- this is one part where it's starting to, to come apart at the seams for them right yeah they don't have enough st- trust in the structure of their society for people to do what's the actual sensible thing right right like b- before she i mean she'd already made herself as immune to to their leverage as possible she doesn't have friends she doesn't have family right you can't threaten her with those things and now she has the thing where she doesn't care if she dies. She says, I don't care if I die. I belong to Nethys. I have to work for him. And I was like, that's that's a very good counterpoint. You you have gained a lot of leverage by not being afraid to die anymore. Uh, but then he goes with, we will make you stupider. And I was like, Jesus Christ, this place keeps getting worse. Yeah, I, I get where she's coming from. And I, I thought that was kind of badass that she said that too. But it's like, you know this, they've, they've got a counterpoint for this, right? And I, so I wasn't, mm. I was... I wasn't shocked that he had one, but yeah, it still hits. And it's yeah. like, yeah, then we'll see if Nethus still likes you. Um, yeah. And it's like, oh, damn, you're right. You could totally lobotomize me without killing me. All right. <laughs> Make me too stupid to serve Nethus, then he'll ditch me. This place is fucked. I mean, it's fucked in a very interesting way. Yeah. He So the, the deal that he offers her is stop withholding things from us, stop presenting them to Keltham first to try to force a concession from us afterwards, and stop trying to condition your obedience on our further concessions. 
The game you have played twice today, you will not be able to play a third time. Have I said it enough ways you comprehend it now? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, this dude is awful, and he's evil, and I kind of see his point. I also, I guess, wouldn't want to have to deal with that shit and keep having to constantly rego renegotiate everything. I don't know. Like, the thing is, while I, I see his point here, and I see her counterpoint, like, neither of them is negotiating. They're just threatening each other, and his threats are more credible, uh, which is good for him. On the other hand, hers have a much higher variance. She might be able to somehow fuck this entire project with Keltham, which not not likely that that will happen. But if it does happen, fucks them a lot harder than it fucks her. So I don't know. They they have two different possible weapons against each other, and seeing them pointing them at each other like this is it's interesting. But I wouldn't call it. A negotiation, really, aside from the same way you negotiate with terrorists, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's negotiation. It's a it's a Mexican standoff. Yes, there we go. Which is kind of a negotiation, right? <laughs> it, kind of. It, it, it might turn into a real negotiation. Um, yeah. But what I, I like that a lot too, and it was fun because you know I guess if I it's hard to to say if I was you know reading slower and thought more about this because we read this very slowly and talk about it for two hours a week, but uh, I would have liked to have thought that. I had the explicit thought that she is a crux in a deal that Asmodeus and Nethus made, right? Mm. I didn't actually think that, but she did, and she says that. And mm -hmm. it's like, look, our god, or you know, our god yesterday, your god today, Asmodeus made a deal with Nethus, and mm -hmm. I, I'm part of this, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it, and you care about what Asmodeus likes a lot, right? Well, then this is this is where we're at. Um, I thought that was just a really cool move for her to make. Yeah. And that's kind of where, like, I think that starts, I think that is where the negotiations are able to kind of start, mm -hmm. where it's like, look, we both want this all to work out. You And we, we want it for very similar reasons, right? Yeah. We want our yeah. gods to be happy. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't say we care about, you know, society prospering when this all works, but that's, you know, that's collateral <laughs> damage. What they really care about is getting into the right hell. Um, yep. But it's like, it's all right, now, now we found our, our even ground, right? Yeah. This is like the part in the Mexican standoff where they realize that no one wants to get shot. Right. This is, dude, the fact that she is doing all this while still burned, like he doesn't heal her till the very end. It's fucking badass and insane. Yeah. Damn. Uh, one of the last things she says is, I'm lawful and I'll keep my deals that are actually sensible deals for sensible people being sensible about them. I'm not an Asmodian anymore and I won't keep a contract that an Asmodian twisted around. Which, that, that line particularly made me really appreciate the evil part in Lawful Evil. Like, you can be lawful and just eject contracts that were ob obviously made in bad faith or with one party being crippled or coerced or somehow fucked over in the deal-making process. Uh, whereas a Lawful Evil god would be like, Meh, still, I'm lawful, I don't care about how fucked you were. Stick to the letter of the law. So, uh, yeah, this, this hell place just keeps... Sounding worse every time. Yeah, I really it. like the, like, no, look, we're going to go by what the contract says, not like this weird subclause that we put in invisible ink at the bottom, you know? What's the term for a contract that is unenforceable because it's immoral? You know, um, this, is a thing. this isn't the mind killer. We don't have a resident lawyer, but we'll just say like a not stupid fuck you contract. <laughs> Very right? well. Yeah. Yeah. Like, do you remember that episode of South Park where it might have been Kyle updates iTunes without reading the end user license agreement? Yes. And he gets... Uh, Human centipede uh, recruited into the human centipede. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this isn't the, this is the kind of contract that Asmodeus would enforce, but that the rest of society and everyone everyone else would say fuck that, right? Yeah, I I agree. It's it's ridiculous. The evil and lawful evil. Yeah, but then they shake hands and he heals her. So I think that maybe we'll get maybe we're through with these torture sessions for a little while, which would be nice. It does sound like it. Fingers least, crossed. Uh, you know, yeah. this got pretty graphic. Mm, no, it wasn't that graphic. It was emotionally compelling. But well, it could have been much more graphic. Yeah, it could have been. It could have been more graphic in how descriptive it was. I guess it was. Um, it was stressful because it made yes. me picture it. I guess it was less less stressful picturing it than it was the eye gouging. Yeah. Anyway, then we get a cut to Broom, our new protagonist. <laughs> is he our new protagonist? I mean, he's. I know he's got an. Is a, it's like a magic dagger or whatever. But it's like I'm picturing him just walking around with an invisibility cloak and a gun, and he's just like <laughs> he's just looking around at everything, just being like, "Am I supposed to shoot that? Am I supposed to shoot him?" Um, mm -hmm. And so he's just looking around for interesting stuff. And it says he has just seen a trembling human girl strip naked and then be set on fire, which challenged his understanding of reality not in the slightest. After that, other mm -hmm. things were said which challenged his understanding of reality significantly more. Did the girl just win? 
that is frankly not where he was expecting this to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I think we both pulled out the second part, but I, I yeah, it's he's just like okay, well, uh, what what do we do here? <laughs> <laughs> should I be stabbing? I'm not. I don't know if I should be stabbing. <laughs> Yeah, Broom says that he can imer- imagine someone carrying around the sort of grudge from being set on fire where they decide to destroy the world about it. He just didn't have any options for do thing- doing anything about that, such as, for example, destroying the world. Um, I'm, I'm starting to get worried that Broom is going to destroy the world, actually. He-, he sounds like the sort of person who has been set on fire and tortured a lot and is carrying around a grudge and just couldn't do anything about it, and is slowly realizing that he might be able to do something about it, and maybe one of the things he might be able to do about it, he will realize later, is destroying the world. And I wouldn't blame him. I uh, I distinctly remember being in a mind state like that. Well, also, this world actually sucks, where ours is okay. But, yeah, uh, like, I I read that, and I just thought that he was kind of just like, you know, he, he, he as of this afternoon, has this new obsession with destroying the world. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I thought that was his first example, because he's like, "Well, that would actually stop this too, right?" Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, uh, don't want to destroy the world. Uh, what could stop me from doing that? Well, destroying the world. But I, I think that's I think it's gonna be like his first thought for everything that he thinks for like the next while, while he accumulates mm-hmm. to being a uh, uh, oracle of Nethys or of uh, mm-hmm. Ottomans. Mm-hmm. But maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he's gonna be a threat. But then in, in that case, Ottomans sucks at her job. So yeah, it, it yeah it it does seem like he's thinking. Somebody here could destroy the world. Do they have motivation to destroy the world? And the answer is always obviously yes, this is hell. (laughs) Everyone has motivation to destroy the world so that they will get out of hell. Yeah. Uh, Including Broom. Yeah. But I want to think that that Ottomans chose him and, you know, over somebody else on purpose. But maybe not. Maybe he actually is bad at oracling people. We don't know. Is is Ottomans playing 5D chess or 1D chess? I sure hope it's 5. I... I would hope so. I don't have. I don't actually have much hope that that is the case, though. I would like to hope so. How about that? Yeah, same. Yeah. Also, just having their random murder dude be a seventy IQ person with a mask for a personality seems like a really bad idea. I, I'm really not sure Ottoman's thought through this. Did it say he was a random seventy IQ person? I mean, it doesn't say what his IQ is, but reading his his train of thought, just reading his sections, I'm like, oh yeah, this is not a smart person this is someone who would be considered mentally mentally handicapped even on earth oh and i probably because that was tortured into him but uh he he does not sound like a normal sentient adult to me i i like put a lot of that up to just how weird his day has been you know up until now he knew exactly what he was he was broom you know his job was to to sweep right right and now he's got all these huge concerns like preventing the world from ending and he's got these weird insights he's got new tools he's suddenly super important I, I think this is just how people would react if, you know, told, hey, by the way, there's this prophecy. You've got to be very, very careful, you know. But I don't know. I think if I knew a person who was a janitor who said, yeah, my name is Broom. I sweep. And that was the majority of his personality, at least the extent that I saw of it. I would not consider him to be a normally functioning adult. No, but you I don't think that I don't think that's what we see here. Like, for all we know, just he's a slave only because he's a halfling. Right. Not because he's dumb. They might just be racist. Well, I'm pretty, I would imagine they are racist, but I also think that he is dumb as well, mentally handicapped. At least from my reading, that is what I've gotten so far, but we should keep our eyes on that because maybe I am reading this very wrong. I think I can totally see why you're reading that because, I mean, he, he's reading, you know, lots of disjointed thoughts and, you know, kind of jumping around, but... Uh, and I'm I, like, he's thinking, if if that was me, would I destroy the world if I was set on fire? I think I would. I would have a grudge. They're, they're going to take my stapler kind of thing. I mean... Maybe. I feel like that. I guess I don't want to say necessarily mentally handicapped, maybe just mentally, you know, damaged by torture, you know? Um, well, yes, I I think that may be the reason why he has that mental damage, but getting damaged mentally makes you mentally handicapped. Yeah, right? damage is damage. Um, yeah. Yeah. I guess we'll see. Um, yeah. I'm curious what other people's uh, readings are on him. Um, I decided I'd take David's advice and just make a uh, chat GPT or GTP4 window where I'm talking to a leading expert on the role-playing game Pathfinder, who loves teaching newcomers about the game. Oh, neat. So I learned about uh, cantrips, and I got some explanation on the alignment stuff that's been hanging me up for a while. This has been really helpful to you. 
Yeah, it's been it's been great, uh, and I'm going nice. to just continue to throw stuff at it. But I wanted to bring one example up to you to see how much I can trust this. Give me a uh, an example of the alignment system with an example for, of each classification from other popular fiction. Okay. Uh, lawful good, Superman, obviously, mm -hmm. but uh, neutral good, Sam Gamgee. Yeah, maybe. Definitely closer to neutral good than lawful good at any rate, because the hobbits don't really have all that much in terms of being strict by the books kind of guys. And to the extent that they do, he's totally violated that by going on an adventure in the first place. <laughs> Good point. So I, I guess that's fair. Because I asked about that. I was like, Sam Gamgee isn't lawful. And because it has to, it says, I apologize for the confusion. And if it makes me feel confused, it has to say it's sorry. Um, uh, Sam Gamgee, we never seem like upholding the law because upholding the law is the good thing to do, right? right. He does the good thing because it's the good thing, not because it's the law. Yeah, which... I think I need to double check because then I asked, did it give Captain America's neutral good? No. Maybe, maybe early Captain America is definitely lawful good, but he 100% yes. goes to neutral good later. But it was fun when I asked it like, to elaborate on Sam Gamgee. It gave me like an explanation of why it chose that. That was totally coherent. I chose him as an example of neutral good because his actions are fundamentally motivated by his innate kindness, empathy, and desire to do good rather than a personal or societal code. Yeah. And I was like, oh, sold. All right. Checks out. Yeah, I liked it. For people who don't know what we're talking about, uh, the episode with David comes out in two days. So I guess you just got a bit of a spoiler. Not spoiler, a bit of a teaser. Yeah. Patrons of the Patient Conspiracy you might have heard it by now. So, Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, the Cool yeah. Kids Club. That's right. All right. Our stop phrase for next week, if people are not following along with Keiko's awesome document, in which case they should just read to the end of episode 10. But the stopping point is... He doesn't look it, but he also seems very, very, very alien and very hard to understand and might do unexpected things because of that. I like this. I, every, every stop phrase has been compelling in its own way. Mm. Guessing they're talking about Keltham here. Um, I got to be talking about Keltham, yeah. But the thing is, that's so obvious that it might be, you know, subverting that. But who else could it be? Uh, maybe Keltham's talking to Broom and realizing that this is an alien who might be very, very dangerous or something, right? Uh, that could be. Last of the several ones, like the, the one that ended like, sure, go ahead, kill them all. <laughs> I was like, oh, what? What's going to happen? She's just going to be told by the god, yeah, go do that hypothetically, right? Yeah. It, I was it like, was, oh, oh, okay. It was a fun kind of uh, alley-oop. Yeah. Yeah. And I did not ex at all expect Broom to be the one thinking, I got to go check on my other person of interest. <laughs> right. So yeah, these these have been neat. I like them. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. All right. I'm looking forward to it. Let's get Let's hop to it. Me too. Okay. Also, uh, support us on the Patreon if you want to. Link is there. It'll be cool of you to do that. One final thing. By actual legit coincidence, Stephen and me did an analysis cast of The Truman Show a couple months before we started Plane Crash. I think it was a great discussion. A link is in the show notes. I'll see you in new week. I will not see anybody next week because I'm going to be at Vibe Camp next week. They're going to have a short break and we will see everybody in two weeks. Oh, right. Okay, cool. So drag out the reading. Good to know. Yeah. Thanks for listening. You guys could be listening to something else. And it's, uh, I appreciate you guys spending two hours listening to this. This is great. Yeah. Okay. Bye. See ya.